come to order. Thank you. Um, I ask uh, unanimous consent to, to authorize the chair to declare recess uh, during the hearing. Um, and uh, without objection, so ordered. Uh, as a reminder, all of you who are out there remotely, uh, please keep your microphone uh, muted or I'll be uh, yelling at you. Uh, to insert a document in the record, please email it to documentsdni at mail.ask.gov. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm going to uh, do the brief opening statement. I want to thank the uh, Secretary uh, for being uh, here today. Uh, we're holding this hearing uh, to uh, um, do some oversight on the implementation of the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. And uh, I appreciate uh, you being here today to uh, tell us about the progress. Um, this may be a, a long day, um, and I appreciate the fact that you're going to make time available in the hope that uh, all members who have questions will have an opportunity. So we're going to move along quickly, and we're going to strictly observe time limits uh, so that uh, we, can, uh, we can move through this uh, with as many members participating as possible. Um, you know, I really appreciate the fact that uh, the IIJ um, a money is uh, uh, getting out the door at a record pace. I mean, this is uh, something that I've been looking forward to and working on since Obama was president when I passed a bill out of a uh, subcommittee to increase spending by $350 billion, which at that time seemed like a phenomenal amount. And obviously, uh, this one is uh, $660 billion dollars finally after uh, 12 years uh, we've got that and uh, you know this is larger than anything else the department has uh, ever had to deal with before uh, and as I understand it uh, you you know so far a portion 75 billion in highway transit and airport formula funds uh, issued notices of funding opportunity for tens of billions more through 22 competitive grant programs uh, you know, this is absolutely unprecedented in terms of the investments we're making and the pace at which we're putting this money out. Uh, the stakes are high. Uh, you know, we want to uh, we want to uh, get this money out. Um, you know, inflation is is eating into uh, you know what we're going to be able to build, and the more quickly we can commit the funds, uh, the more uh, we will get done. And uh, you know. I expect that we'll hear some uh, criticism from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Um, but, you know, sadly, uh, almost none of them here today or on this committee voted uh, for this legislation, uh, which was amazing to me at the time of passage. I know Donald Trump didn't like it because um, he couldn't do it. Uh, and uh, this actually got done. But um, it is uh, a record amount of uh, long overdue investment. Uh, and we aren't just, as I said before, and please, we're not just trying to do Eisenhower 8.0. Uh, at the same time, uh, you're looking at, uh, you have guidance on uh, fix it first, something that was stripped out by the Senate, the 10 members of the Senate, 10 Republicans and two Democrats, none of whom have a major role on any of the three committees of jurisdiction in the Senate who wrote this bill. Um, they used our template uh, in terms of money and more routine things, but uh, they uh, bristled at the idea that we would deal uh, meaningfully uh, with climate change and look at alternatives to just an, an infinite amount of uh, highway building, uh, which will not solve our problems. As we all know, there's something called induced demand. And, uh, you know, I talked a lot about the Virginia Railway uh, as opposed to expanding 95 South, and I was hoping that, and I'm hoping states will replicate that around the country, uh, where we can reduce carbon pollution, move people more efficiently, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, look toward a 21st century uh, system in this country. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, you're encouraging the states, you're not mandating or penalizing them, uh, you're not taking away decision-making authority, uh, but we're just asking them, and I've uh, spoken to uh, the, uh, the Association of State Highway Officials about this, just take a look at this. Fix it first, uh, do the critical maintenance we need to do, and then secondly, 
uh, look, uh, you know, when you're, when you're having a congestion problem, look and see what is the best solution. Is it, uh, you know, attempt to build more highway miles uh, or is uh, there a way to move the people uh, more efficiently? Uh, I also appreciate the fact that, um, you know, we're going to, uh, I'll be sending you a letter soon um, to, um, you know, uh, support your efforts to require measurement and reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, you know, transportation is uh, our single largest source of uh, carbon pollution, and we do need to address that. Uh, so uh, with that uh, said, uh, you know, I uh, would now yield to the ranking member. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for calling this hearing, and thank you, Mr. Uh, Secretary, for, uh, uh, for being here today. Since you last testified before um, the committee, Congress did pass uh, the $1.2 trillion infrastructure package, and although uh, many members on my side of the aisle voted against it, um, mostly because there was no Republican input, and then ultimately no House input in the bill. Um, having said that, I do recognize it is now uh, the law of the land, and, uh, and I respect that fact. My focus now is going to be on uh, oversight of the law and ensuring that it's implemented efficiently, effectively, and adheres to the letter of the law. And why is this important? Because our nation is dealing with crisis after crisis, from a spending crisis to an energy crisis. We have a supply chain crisis, uh, a workforce shortage crisis, and all of these uh, problems are feeding into an historic inflation crisis. And it's astounding that inflation has increased 550 percent. Americans know that they can no longer buy the same amount of food uh, or gasoline or, or other necessities with their hard-earned dollars uh, as they could just a year and a half ago, um, obviously not by a long shot. And the same holds true for our infrastructure dollars. Committee Republicans heard some pretty grim warnings last week uh, during our um, uh, roundtable on inflation. Companies working in the transportation space are struggling with the exploding costs across the board. And some of these companies can't shoulder uh, the risk of inflation, which means some of the businesses, especially smaller ones, um, are unable to even bid on some of the jobs. At the same time, states are running over their transportation budgets uh, as they have the impossible task of estimating project costs, uh, which are gonna continue to uh, increase exponentially. In my home state of Missouri, they're estimating that uh, they're going to go $140 million over budget in their current year's transportation plan. States are also receiving fewer and fewer bids on their projects. Um, with all the, the regulatory red tape, uh, they aren't able to get through the process in time for a company's proposal uh, to stay true to their original estimated costs. And that's why it's incumbent upon the Department and Congress to make sure that every single dollar from the law counts and is directed towards projects safely and efficiently uh, to move people, to move goods, and, and clear the bottlenecks uh, that are adding to the supply chain crisis. However, many stakeholders have already expressed concerns about the administration's implementation of the infrastructure law, and I share some of those concerns. Just to highlight a few, <clears throat> one of the concerns to me and, and many others is that December 16th uh, of last year, the Federal Highway Administration guidance memo Mr. Secretary, I know that, that you've spoken about some of the concerns raised since this guidance was issued, uh, but I hope you recognize the fact that, that uh, it remains a serious concern, serious source of concern and confusion because it pushes uh, the administration's own priorities, including a bias towards um, adding new highway capacity over what's written in the law uh, itself. Another related concern I have is the number of the department's competitive grant notices that also include language doubling down on the federal highway guidance. Uh, the notices for grant programs like the Infra Grants, um, RAISE, um, the Mega Grants Rural, uh, and the Reconnecting Communities, they all clearly show that the administration isn't as laser focused as it needs to be on fundamental transportation policy and projects that actually improve mobility. One additional concern I want to highlight is in regard to the one federal decision um, provisions which were included in the law and are critical to cutting the red tape for for so many of the projects. Instead of simply implementing the OFD provisions, the administration released um, its action plan on, on project permitting on May, for, or May 11th, and it doesn't seem to mention uh, OFD. So again, here's another example of the law laying out an explicit policy which the administration appears to be ignoring in favor of accelerating projects 
to fit its own agenda. The result of the administration putting its agenda ahead of the, uh, ahead of the law uh, of the land and even acting in, in contradiction to the law in some cases uh, is, is you know, the infrastructure funding. Already, it's dramatically uh, devalued by this crippling uh, inflation, as has been pointed out, uh, and is being diluted even further. Um, this is not shaping up to be the infrastructure bill that, that uh, Americans were promised. And now more than ever, this administration needs to focus on real infrastructure and on policies that can get us out of uh, so many of these, uh, these crises. Um, so with that, um, I do want to thank the chairman again for, uh, uh, for holding this, uh, this hearing. And thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. I know you are busy, um, but coming before Congress, uh, it does mean a lot to a lot of members. I uh, thank the ranking member. Now I'd like to uh, formally uh, uh, recognize uh, the uh, Honorable uh, Pete Buttigieg, Secretary of Transportation. Thanks again uh, for joining us today. Look forward to your testimony. And without objection, uh, our witness's full statement will be included in the record. And since your written testimony has been a part of the record, the committee uh, requests that um, you limit your uh, initial remarks to five minutes. Uh, with that, you may proceed. Good morning, and thank you very much, uh, Chair DeFazio. Thank you, Ranking Member Graves, and thank you, members of the committee, for the opportunity to join you this morning. Before I begin, I, I want in particular to recognize you, Chair DeFazio, for 36 years of extraordinary service and to congratulate you on your upcoming retirement. There are few who can claim to have done more than you to champion safety, to promote environmental justice, and to advance transportation systems to benefit all Americans. I also want to acknowledge that earlier this year we lost a member and former chair of this committee, the late Representative Don Young, who represented the people of Alaska for nearly a century, half a century, and was often willing to cross the aisle to get things done for the American people. Thanks to leaders like Chair DeFazio, Representative Young, and so many of you, we now have the most transformative transportation investment in most of our lifetimes in the form of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And it couldn't have come at a more important time. From delays at ports to freight congestion to shortages in aviation, American transportation has rarely confronted this many intersecting challenges at once, both immediate and entrenched. Nearly 43,000 people died in traffic crashes last year, each of them a parent or child, colleague or friend. Transportation produces more carbon emissions than any other sector at a time when the nations of the world are rallying to confront the climate challenge. And as Americans grapple with the effects of inflation, we know that transportation is the second largest household expense after housing, affecting every family budget. This is also, though, a moment of enormous opportunity with reason for optimism. Thanks to the infrastructure law, my department has never seen a moment of greater potential than now to build transportation resources that connect everyone safely, efficiently, and affordably to the things we need and the people we love. Needless to say, we've been busy. We've already announced nearly $84 billion in grant funding from across the department. Every few days, we have another great announcement. Bridge repair programs that'll help us move more goods more affordably and people more safely. A national electric vehicle charging network with the potential to bring cost-saving technology to rural communities and help to fight the climate crisis and safety initiatives that will reduce crashes and save lives, for example, getting rid of outdated railroad crossings to prevent tragedies like the one we saw recently in Cheriton County. Ranking Member Graves, my thoughts are with all of your constituents, the passengers, the families who were impacted by that derailment. And I wanna uh, emphasize that DOT will continue to support NTSB's investigation and work to improve railroad safety nationwide. From safety to reliability to affordability, name a dimension of transportation that you deal with in daily life, we have a program addressing it. All of this is gonna help people get where they need to go while creating jobs and economic opportunity across the country. You all know better than anyone that passing the law is only the first step. Success means delivering good projects that improve the lives of your constituents. I'll give you just a few examples of the work we're supporting. Alpena, Michigan is a community of fewer than 10,000 people where one of the largest employers is the local cement plant. We awarded the city funding to modernize their port so it can bring in larger cargo ships. That means more business for the plant, more jobs for the people of Alpena, and better access to materials for manufacturers across the region. Within the city limits of Baltimore, it can take hours to get from home to work if you don't have a car. 
So we're funding 10 new miles of dedicated bus lanes to connect residential neighborhoods with major employers in a single corridor that supports more than 180,000 jobs. In 2007, Findlay, Ohio, a town of 40,000, flooded. Hundreds of homes and businesses were damaged or forced to move. Now, we're helping Findlay replace a century-old railroad bridge with a modern ballast deck bridge that will not only help people get to work, but also reduce the risk of flooding damage in the future. And these are just a sample from among literally thousands of projects that will help Americans live and work where they want, help businesses deliver better products, and help families save for the future. It can even save lives. In this good work, we will need your continued leadership and partnership, as well as that of communities across the country, organized labor, businesses, state, tribal, and local officials, and so many more. Together, we have the opportunity to improve countless lives, support good-paying jobs, strengthen America's manufacturers, modernize our infrastructure for decades to come, and cement America's position as the world's leading economy. So thank you once more for inviting me to be here today, and I'm looking forward to addressing your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, I will now move on to questions. I'll first recognize the uh, chair of the Surface Transportation Subcommittee, Eleanor Holmes Norton, uh, for her questions. Eleanor will be uh, virtual. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, uh, Ms. Bujet, for being here today. Uh, as you know, the Department of Transportation grant recipients have historically uh, been prohibited. Have historically been prohibited from uh, utilizing geographic or economic or other hiring preferences, uh, preferences regarding the use of labor on DOT funded uh, transportation projects. But the new infrastructure law provided new statutory authority for recipients uh, of DOT grants to utilize local labor hiring preferences. And we call them local hires on, on construction uh, con uh, contracts. I do support this authority. As a former mayor yourself, can you explain what this new authority means for cities and other grant recipients carrying out infrastructure projects, for example, of grant recipients required to utilize um, local hiring preferences? Well, thank you very much. Uh, as both secretary and as mayor, I've, I've heard too often uh, stories from neighborhoods that have long craved some kind of infrastructure investment finally see it, only for residents to look at the work site and wonder if any of the people getting the good paying jobs working on that project uh, come from anywhere near the area where the project is being done. Uh, but as you mentioned uh, earlier, our ability to support that kind of work was restricted to pilot programs. Uh, using the authority uh, provided for us in the new law, we will be able to support local hiring provisions uh, to the extent they are supported on the ground in ways that we think are going to contribute enormously to opportunity in communities that perhaps in the past have been left out of the good paying job creation and the ladders to the middle class that come with it. And so we will continue uh, using the, the authorities provided in the law uh, to support that kind of work and support that extension of access to opportunity for so many who have not felt that they've been part of it in administrations or in years past. So they, they can use local hiring preferences, are they required? to use local hiring preferences? Uh, I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat the question? Uh, are grant recipients required to utilize local hiring preferences? So we encourage local hire. It depends, of course, on the program, but uh, federal aid highway uh, programming now paves the way for grant recipients to do so, and we'll be working with them every step of the way. Okay, I'll be encouraging um, my... Uh, transportation uh, authority to um, require uh, local hiring preferences wherever 
Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask you about Union Station here in the District of Columbia. Uh, the Federal Railroad Administration recently required, revised its proposal uh, to develop Union Station. I appreciate the renewed focus on better serving transit, rail, and bus riders, along with cyclists that are that are provided in this proposal. Uh, but it's also critical to ensure that Union Station design works for DC residents who rely on local transit, food, and retail options, and who will be impacted on the day on a daily basis by changes in traffic patterns in the area. What is your department doing to engage with local residents about the project and to account for their needs and suggestions going forward? Well, as your question importantly notes, uh, there are many modes of transportation that converge at Union Station. And while it is certainly uh, known partly for its role in intercity rail and longer distance travel, it's also very significant as a hub for transit and as a uh, retail site that's very meaningful for the immediate neighborhood. Uh, both in terms of access to retail and in terms of access to jobs. So we consider it very important, as we would in any uh, uh, project, but, but certainly with, with all of the overlapping equities here, for the voices of community members to be heard. I know that's expressed partly uh, through you and through your office, but uh, also uh, expect for there to be immediate means of input. And we'll work with the project sponsor and knowing that the District of Columbia, of course, is very uh, hands-on with this to make sure that we support that kind of participation and that all those uh, relevant concerns are heard. Thank you. Uh, thank the gentlelady. And now turn to Ranking Member uh, Sam Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My, my question is actually fairly simple because um, one of the things I'm concerned about and been pretty active in over the years is trying to figure out how we make the Highway Trust Fund uh, solvent. Um, and we've obviously got a lot of vehicles on the road that aren't paying for the use of the road. Um, you know, and again, it's something I've been pretty active in. And I know there was a alternative funding uh, board, I think, that was put in the uh, uh, infrastructure plan. I'm just curious if how that's coming along. And, and I know we had some pilot projects going on out there too, some VMT pilot projects and a few things. I don't know. We're, we're not talking about that anymore. And I know it's a monumental task um, when it's eventually going to have to be tackled uh, to figure that out. But just curious on your thoughts and where we are in that process and how those pilots are, are going. Thank you. Yes, there, there were uh, the pilots that were authorized previously through the FAST Act. A number of states have pursued them and uh, uh, we're always uh, interested in, in their experience and trying to get information about uh, the results there. Uh, further pilots are provided for in the IAJA and uh, we'll, we'll support that work as well. I think ultimately there are some profound policy considerations that will need to be addressed in terms of the long-term viability of the Highway Trust Fund. Uh, and as you know, for the IAJA, it was very important to this administration uh, not to take any step that would be inconsistent with the president's commitment not to raise taxes on anybody and making less than $400,000 a year. Uh, but in, in some way, shape, or form, we need to be prepared for a, a model of sustainable highway trust funding that is different from the one that we've inherited. Uh, and I, uh, as, as these pilots continue to take shape, and, and we can uh, update your office on uh, the, the federal uh, uh, kind of side in terms of how we're laying the groundwork for that pursuant to IAJA, I think it'll give us some important data points that uh, we're going to need, especially if Congress decides for the long run that it's not as prepared as it has been in the past to commit general fund dollars for that purpose. And we're going to continue to pull general fund dollars in. And I, and I worry about that, you know, the precedent that it, it sets. And transportation, we've always tried to be a, you know, pay-as-you-go and, and, uh, and a fee-based um, process. And I'm concerned about, you know, just the movement away from that. Um, and, uh, but it's, it is a concern. Thanks. I yield back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, now, uh, uh, Representative uh, Eddie Bernice Johnson. Yes, thank you very much. And let me thank the secretary for making himself available and for the job he's doing on behalf of the administration. And I want to thank you for visiting Dallas Fort Worth, but you only saw two programs, so I hope you'll be coming back soon. Um, 
it's critically important to make sure that everyone is benefiting from this legislation. So could you discuss what the federal DOT is doing to ensure that disadvantaged business programs are working properly and are guaranteeing the minority and women-owned businesses are getting a fair share of these transportation dollars? Thanks for the question. This is very important to us. It is, of course, the rationale for the DBE programs that are provided for in the law and also just an essential matter of fairness in terms of the business opportunity that parallels, in my view, the need for fairness in labor opportunity that was at stake in the question that Representative Norton asked earlier. Uh, in order to make good on that, uh, we have been actively working not just to uh, ensure that there is compliance with, with the DBE law, uh, but in order to make sure that we are better alerting the DBE community to the business opportunities that it might create. For example, our Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization has been uh, preparing events around the country to help bring together uh, officials and contractors to preview the opportunities and get a better sense of how to compete for those opportunities. Uh, we the, know the gentleman would suspend for one second. I believe uh, someone's microphone's on, and I believe it might be Eleanor Holmes Norton. Please mute your microphones. Continue, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Uh, we recognize that our processes need to be user-friendly, especially if we are trying to expand the base of historically excluded business owners who have access to these federal opportunities. And so we will be working with uh, the states, uh, the, the transit agencies, and others who are being funded, while also making sure that we uh, meet our own ambitious goals for direct federal procurement, uh, which have been increased this year on the SDB side. Uh, to 20% and uh, making sure that we're meeting our, our goals in-house I think will also give us important uh, expertise and experience which will be relevant for us to work with the, the states and the other partners on for uh, the, uh, uh, the effective inclusion of uh, various businesses and opportunities created by the bill writ large. Well, thank you very much. Now, uh, I know that this is not important to a lot of people, but cities that were impacted by highways and, and disadvantaged communities uh, are really concerned about it. It's a small amount of money as, a, as we look at the country. But I'm hoping uh, that we will provide some robust funding for reconnected communities. Uh, I know that in my district, in Dallas, Texas, right in the downtown areas, we have at least two major areas and so I'm hoping that there will be some attention given uh, to those important uh, reconnections. Well, thank you. We had the great pleasure of rolling out the Reconnecting Communities program recently in, in Birmingham and have seen just enormous interest around the country in knitting together places that have been separated or divided by a piece of infrastructure, be it a, a railway, a highway, uh, an interchange, or, or something else. I think that we'll learn a great deal through this uh, first ever round of applications coming in. And uh, we recognize that the program will very likely be oversubscribed, that we'll get more than $200 million worth of applications this first year. But also hope in the work that we will be able to fund to light the way for what jurisdictions may be able to do with their own dollars, uh, even if not earmarked for this purpose. Uh, knowing that that benefits the entire community uh, with better transportation networks while also addressing some of the uh, harms that have been created by choices in the past. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chair. I think my time is just about expired. Okay, thank the gentlelady. Uh, now, Representative Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Continuing on with that theme, you recently announced a billion-dollar program aimed at combating alleged racism in road projects. At the same time, DOT is actively supporting the construction of the doomed California high-speed rail project, despite reports that indicate the project is, in fact, displacing and destroying low-income minority communities in the track's path. So my question is, why are you dismantling existing highways in the name of racial equity while you're also supporting a project that's actively harming low-income minority communities? So every project has an impact. And what we think the law provides for is a process for local communities to weigh in on how those impacts affect them 
And unless there is a civil rights violation, in which case my department, of course, will very proactively address it, then it falls to the project sponsor to decide how to balance those concerns. But in terms of the highway work, the, the way I view it is, if federal dollars were ever used in a way that separates or segregates, then a pretty good use of federal dollars now would be to connect and to address those harms. And my view also is that the entire community, not just those who were disadvantaged, is better off when a community is served by transportation infrastructure that does in fact connect more than it divides. Well, that sounds pretty good rhetorically, but in reality, what we know is that this money pit in California that's largely being subsidized by federal tax dollars is doing exactly what you purport to prevent with this billion dollar allocation. So I think that that is worth revisiting at some point to determine if in fact that's it's, certainly that's happening. Is, it, is that a good expenditure of money? But let me move on in the interest of time. Um, <laughs> Ranking member Graves mentioned a 550% increase in inflation since your boss took office. That's wreaking havoc on our economy. It's destroying uh, particularly transportation businesses. That includes the small suppliers and the disadvantaged business enterprises that work in that space. Companies just can't afford to cash flow this increased inflation and shoulder that risk. And what's worse is it's creating a vacuum in the marketplace that allows for foreign companies to come in and further uh, decimate U.S. industries and economies. So my question is, can DOT provide guidance to states and other recipients that inflation adjustments are required in transportation contracts? So cost containment is a, a major focus for us right now in implementing the law because we're hearing this from both project sponsors and the business community. The impact of cost escalation and inflation is unquestionably going to affect our ability to deliver. I'm less sure that this is something that would put U.S. companies at a disadvantage to international companies for the simple reason that inflation is international. Uh, I was just in Germany uh, a few months ago. Uh, inflation there, some around 8 or 9%. So a German company, I imagine, would face the same kind of cost escalation. With respect, I'm less company. concerned about a German company and more concerned about a Chinese company, which subsidize at a much, much higher rate than anybody else. And they do that obviously for reasons to disrupt our economy and to jeopardize our national security. So that's my focus there is to make sure we're not creating an opportunity for uh, Chinese SOEs <laughs> to come in and occupy space that should be occupied by U.S. businesses and particularly these DBEs that we're trying to ensure have an opportunity to perform in that marketplace. But let me move on. Has DOT performed a legal analysis to see what is possible? To see what is possible to address inflation? Sure. Sure, we're, we're looking at it every day. We, we don't need, need legal analysis to tell us that uh, we've got to make sure that I'm talking about the contracting to, uh, process. You mean in terms of imposing a new requirement on the states? Yes. I have not addressed imposing additional requirements on the states for this purpose, but we could certainly look into that if, if, uh, if you so, don't. So what I'm asking is for contract reviews to address inflation, has there been a legal analysis there? Because we, when this was implemented, and we've seen inflation continue on an upward trajectory, and there were no provisions um, offered uh, to address that. And so we're, we're, we're seeing that it's very, very difficult for companies to, to maintain pace with this rate of inflation. And so so our, I guess what I'm asking is, um, are our con our, our contracts firm? Are they fixed? Or is there any provisions in place for them to address that inflation? <laughs> So often contracts will have a contingency factor that can affect any unanticipated pressure In, in this prices. case, do they have a contingency factor? Again, I, it would depend on the specific program involved, but I uh, would certainly welcome a chance to work with your office to see if you agree that uh, that's adequately contemplated in the contract framework. And any other provisions being discussed about what can be done for what DOT can do to help small businesses and DBEs continue to, to participate in this market? A couple of things that, that we think can be helpful here. One, of course, is, is simply doing everything we can to ensure that projects move forward swiftly, right? The, the greater the rate of inflation, the greater the cost of delay. And so uh, as we're looking at everything from uh, technical assistance to support moving through the permitting process, that's something that becomes even more important in a high inflation environment. Uh, other mechanisms that I think could make a difference here are ones that could look at the timing of uh, the, the spikes that you see in the cost of some of the different inputs. Not that you can predict the divergence between, let's say, the cost of steel or the cost of labor three years from now, but there may be ways to help 
project sponsors like transit agencies or uh, state highway departments uh, at least map out where some of the bulges are likeliest to occur uh, in, uh, in the availability or the, or the restriction of supply. And I think that could make a difference too. So that's an example of the kind of thing we're exploring with them as we partner to try to make sure we get the absolute most value for these taxpayer dollars. Okay, thank you. I feel back. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we now turn to Representative Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Secretary, I have a very Washington State focused question to start, and it has to do with the culvert funding. We passed the, an $800 million uh, program as part of the IAJA that included uh, contributions from states, locals, and tribal governments to replace culverts. It's a big issue in our state, and when can we expect information about IAJA culvert funding program? So we're, we're hard at work on this. It is a, a new territory for us in, in many regards. So we've been working with interagency partners like uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and others. Uh, I've told my team I'd, I'd like to see this uh, guidance out by the time the salmon are finished running, uh, and hopefully it'll be before the peak. So that's the best <laughs> answer I can give you. Uh, late summer is really There might be no salmon running at all if we don't get the culvert funding out. We're, uh, we're hard at work on it. Yeah, I, I understand. I wanted to underscore, underline that for us in the Northwest. Thanks so much. Changing the direction a little bit, uh, one, one aspect of the equity question. Um, we've been exploring equity issues in my district and throughout the country, and it's, 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 uh, a lot, there's a lot of variety in how people define equity and so on, but there are aspects of it. One issue has to do with equity and, and data collection. If we don't collect good data, then we don't really know specifically the impacts uh, on some communities make it impossible for DOT to factor that into community efforts to address, uh, address um, inequity. So uh, how, how have you used data collection for underrepresented groups and how is that factored into the equity plan action, equity action plan in the DOT? So what we're trying to do is strike the right balance between gathering enough data to set good policy and know how we're doing as far as the, the effects, benefits, and impacts of our policies and projects on disadvantaged communities without creating such a burdensome framework for data collection that it's actually low-income communities or small rural communities, in other words, the, the ones we'd most want to help from an equity perspective, uh, that find it prohibitive to apply for projects or to participate in our processes. I think that balance leaves room for us to gather data at a more granular level, though, and I think we have a responsibility to do that. We still have relatively little visibility, for example, on uh, who gets the economic benefit of, of the dollars once they go out of our, our building, so to speak. Uh, and I think that, uh, especially given what technology now makes possible in terms of managing this data, uh, we're in a position to, in what I hope will be an administratively lightweight fashion, uh, gather more information than we've ever had and, and use that for decision support. There may be examples. Uh, Puget Sound Regional Council is, uh, has a data tracker uh, on equity that uh, we can pass on to you, we're looking at. Uh, but related to this issue of equity and small rural communities, which I also represent, got a big variety in my district, and one of the challenges that they have, and we shared with uh, Mayor Landrieu as well, is the just the lack of capacity to apply for competitive grants. You know, competitive grants that are called rural transportation grants, and they, and they just don't have the capacity to get their hands, uh, get their arms around that. Has the DOT thought through this problem? Because I know Mayor, Mayor Landrieu has heard of this issue throughout the implementation phase. Yes, two, two things were, were, at least two things I can point to that, that we're doing about this. It, it resembles my own experience as a mayor who led a city that, that didn't necessarily have the resources for a robust federal affairs team. And, uh, and there are communities much smaller than my hometown of South Bend trying to get access here. The first is to make the processes simpler on the front end. So when you see us taking a step like a combined notice of funding opportunity that rolls infra and mega and the rural surface transportation program into one, part of what we're trying to do is just have literally fewer pages of paper out there in, in the process uh, so that it is easier to navigate for an applicant of any size. The second thing is to make sure that we're proactively engaging project sponsors or would-be project sponsors and where possible, and we do have some funding for this, uh, though uh, there's always going to be more demand than we can support, uh, the kind of direct technical assistance that can help walk them through the process, especially when you're looking at a first-time applicant. Okay. Thanks. Um, and then on um, a workforce issues in equity, perhaps you, you touched on this with a uh, discussion on DBE, but um, uh, and, and, and you have in some respects, but are there other steps that DOT is taking 
um, to ensure that um, minor, minority owned businesses are in fact considered for and selected for these projects? Quite a few, and, and uh, part of how I, I view this is that it's not only a matter of fairness, although that's reason enough, but also the, the volume and the pace of infrastructure work we're taking on as a country is going to demand everything that, that we can provide as a country as far as talent, entrepreneurial talent and skilled work. And what that means is that we can't succeed if we leave any talent on the table. And so as you look across our programs, some of them can directly support workforce development in a way that we think benefits both labor and DBE ownership. Uh, some of it uh, doesn't require that, but uh, certainly uh, leaves space for project sponsors to do so. And the effects can I, are, are Can I stop you there? Because I, I want to respect the five-minute rule, mm -hmm. and uh, before the, the chair makes me respect the five-minute rule. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, we'll follow up with your staff with the rest of the answer. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Representative Gibbs. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, just to follow up a little bit on Congressman Crawford's questions. Uh, my understanding, the Federal Transit Authority recently put out guidance to at least one of their regional offices that suggests transit grants recipients through OMB uh, regulations are allowed the federal resources to help uh, cover material cost increases from previously negotiated contracts. Uh, have similar memos gone out for highway and other uh, uh, offices? Uh, I would have to uh, get back to you on mode by mode how each of the different operating administrations is trying to accommodate uh, those things that but, are taking but, place. But you, but you can concur that the Federal Transit Authority has done that? Uh, I'll make sure, but uh, I, I certainly don't know anything that would contradict that. Okay. Thank you. Um, also, uh, do you agree that investing in for federal port infrastructure dollars in improving efficiency, including automation and new technologies, would help improve port operations and relieve supply chain bottlenecks? We strongly believe in funding port infrastructure that will make a positive difference to okay. both the port's ability to move goods yeah. and to the surrounding communities. Are you, are you aware that the current, there are currently restrictions on using federal dollars for these purposes for automation and uh, uh, yeah, basically automation uh, infrastructure? So it, as you likely know, there is a lot of difference of opinion and uh, difference in the research on where automation in fact yields to productivity increases and where it doesn't. And uh, there's uh, quite a bit of skepticism about how that could work in the U.S. context. That said, uh, there are so many things that we can invest in and are investing in that unquestionably benefit the efficiency and the throughput of ports. For example, with the Port Infrastructure Development Program in the last round, uh, we sent about $52 million to Long Beach. That's going to allow them to build about 10,000 additional feet of on-dock rail, which helps you without having to wait for a chassis or have the truck go between, get those containers on their way. And we're going to continue to look for ways to support throughput, again, uh, hopefully in, in a fashion that also benefits the surrounding community. Well, I, yeah, I would think, you know, sometimes there's always some resistance to automation and new technologies because of labor issues and all that. And I can think of it if historically where we'd be in the agricultural community if we resisted automation, uh, where we'd be if we protected the uh, phone operators back in the 70s, the te new technologies come up out from that. So, you, you know, I think historically, uh, technology has, has uh, maybe uh, jobs have gone by the wayside, but then in addition, but the result is uh, different new jobs, a higher uh, paying jobs for improving standard of living. So I think that's a thing to keep in the back of your head that automation is sometimes tough, but it's usually, uh, you know, the correct way to go, it's, at least historically. And, across many sectors of our economy. Um, you may be aware that pipelines are one of the safest and most efficient environmentally uh, way to uh, transport energy. Uh, yeah, I'm concerned that this administration's anti-energy agenda at the time when gas prices and inflation have reached all-time highs, Congress back in 2020 passed bipartisan legislation to boost pipeline safety and efficiency. Uh, can you please provide us an update on the implementation of this, this law that was passed in 22 years ago? Thank you. PHMSA has been hard at work uh, making sure that uh, the, the provisions of the Pipes Act are enacted, both uh, in terms of making sure that we have the right uh, kind of staffing to support it and uh, the rulemakings that are, uh, uh, that are called for in the legislation. I would be happy to get you uh, more details, but the bottom line is that uh, we will continue to meet our safety mission, uh, whatever other policy questions are being debated, and uh, PHMSA has taken a number of steps to, uh, I believe, enhance, even just in the time that, uh, since the legislation was passed, uh, to enhance uh, our uh, already uh, very strong track record in terms yeah, of uh, safety. I, I, I realize in your, in your purview, safety is 
in your jurisdiction. Uh, but I don't think there's been really any pipelines permitted in this administration. It might not come under your purview, might come under the Army Corps, the EPA. But uh, restricting this pipeline uh, permitting access to exploration in, in, in uh, the United States is limiting our exploration and our ability to uh, produce more energy. Because if you don't have the pipelines to put the natural gas in, they can't uh, produce the wells. And uh, so i just make that comment. Uh, also, uh, uh, the Maritime Administration uh, permits for deep water ports, that's the only thing they, they have a granting permit for. Um, uh, there's been a release of environmental impact study. Uh, I understand the first release of the draft environmental impact study was to provide multiple language information in nearby communities, even though such information had already been provided part of the original DEIS. Um, I guess this administration, if, if they, they meet all their permits, the, the, the applicant, meet all the environmental requirements are met, will the Maritime Administration provide a positive record of a decision uh, on this? Uh, uh, so once applicants have uh, fully satisfied the requirements of the EIS, then, uh, uh, then the deep water uh, port can be licensed. I can tell you in the last three years, Merit's engaged over 20 companies with interest in developing uh, new facilities uh, with eight deep water port export uh, applications that came in during that time. Uh, I believe two of those were withdrawn, but the remaining six are under review and we'll review them uh, uh, according to the responsibilities that Mayor Ed has under the law. I just hope they meet the requirements that are approved. Thank you and yield back. Uh, thanks, gentlemen. I would now turn to Representative Napolitano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Secretary, thank you for announcing the funding opportunity for the Railroad Crossing Elimination Program. Funding is incredibly important to my district, and the money for the Great Separations is significant, but just as significant is uh, the uh, effective coordination between government sponsors and the private railroad companies who can hold up these projects with excessive requirements, unnecessary private railroad improvements on taxpayer dime, and delays. How is the department ensuring that railroad companies and all stakeholders are effective partners to quickly implement railroad grade separation projects? Secondly, I greatly appreciate the administration's Justice 40 initiative that directs 40% of federal funds to uh, disadvantaged communities. Is the Justice 40 initiative being implemented for all your grant programs, and in particular, your transit capital investment grant program? And one more question. And very proud to have Foothill Transit in my district, leading the nation for more than a decade in electric and fuel zero emissions buses, and has invited you to visit the facilities. I extended the invitation to you personally in the letter that I just handed you. Since zero emissions buses are new technology, how is FTA working with experienced agencies like Foothill Transit to ensure information and best practices are shared amongst transit agencies as they receive infrastructure law funding for zero emission buses. Thank you, I'll, I'll try to, uh, let me try to take those in reverse order. Uh, so with regard to the zero emission buses, we, we recognize there are a lot of agencies like Foothill Transit that already have quite a bit of expertise uh, in, in this regard. And we wanna make sure that, uh, that that's taken on board. So uh, FTA is doing a lot of convening through uh, efforts like the Transit Vehicle Innovation Deployment Centers Initiative uh, to try to bring the, the different players together. Uh, and uh, actually I believe uh, uh, Foothill Transit was among the agencies on an advisory panel in a position to share their expertise on this because uh, we do need to make sure that uh, more agencies understand and, and are equipped to, to take advantage of the, of the funding and, and to make these uh, 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 clean vehicle deployments that are going to be so important for their future. Uh, with regard to Justice 40, um, I can tell you that the, the entire $20 billion uh, uh, per year uh, programming of the FTA supports equity and transportation. Uh, and you know this can take different forms, and uh, I think the the formal criteria and guidance related to Justice 40 is uh, is, is uh, um, still being uh, framed up at the interagency level. But uh, we're certainly not waiting to uh, take actions that are going to meet uh, those goals, knowing that you know, so many of the communities that are overburdened and underserved are also those that stand to gain the most from having excellent, uh, convenient accessible and clean transportation brought to them and the economic opportunity that comes with it. Um, and then on the rail grade crossings, this is an issue that, that we're hearing about from communities in every part of the country of, of every size. And we consider it very important, uh, not only from a safety perspective, of course, 
but also as we discuss issues like more fluid movement of goods and cargo, uh, this is uh, certainly a concern because those at-grade crossings are associated with uh, uh, slow orders and, and other um, measures for, for safety purposes that wind up impacting the, the, the fluidity of the overall system. Uh, so we're, we're very pleased to have uh, now the, the dedicated railroad crossing elimination program in addition to other uh, rail funding like Chrissy that, that, that can help in this regard. And FRA is, is very actively engaging all of the different players, communities, uh, railroads, uh, and any other interested stakeholders on how to make sure that, uh, uh, that this can uh, be effectively used. It can be challenging because sometimes there is an infrastructure owner that is different than the project sponsor. You imagine a city coming to the table, wanting to get rid of a, a, an at-grade crossing, needing to engage with a railroad that, that actually has the asset. And so we're, we're doing what we can to try to make sure that there's the right communication so that these applicants can be successful. Thank you very much. The uh, fact that uh, the railroads have been good partners in my area, but they still don't um, provide the funding necessary yeah to uh, complete the project or at least uh, be a partner with the state and the Fed. And then uh, on the grant program, uh, how about the Transit Capital Investment Grant Program? Sorry, what about the Capital Investment Grant? That, that was on the Justice 40. Yes, so uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, the, the whole intent of, uh, of the, the transit programming writ large is, of course, to connect people to, to opportunity and to where they need to be. And the kinds of communities that Justice 40 is looking at are often those that stand to gain a great deal by the work that's being done in CIG. And, and so, again, what, what I would emphasize is, uh, you know, even, um, even in those areas that may or may not fit the, the formal or technical definition of, of, of Justice 40, uh, they will already, certainly CIG will already have criteria that are relevant to the spirit of that program. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Uh, thanks, gentlelady. Now, uh, Representative Webster. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Secretary, for appearing. We really appreciate it. Um, as you know, the, the revenue from the Highway Trust Fund is uh, not sufficient to meet the transportation needs. And so over the years, since uh, maybe 2007, 2008, we put money in, and uh, I, that money is um, being spent, and it's going to be spent up again here in the next few years. We'll need to do it again. And um, the CBO estimates that it's maybe 2026 or 2027 we'll run out of money again. The... Um, Administration, though, is focusing on promoting electric cars and on uh, has championed a, a gas tax uh, holiday. Those are things that take away revenue, not, not add to it. So um, my question is, do you have a, uh, something that wouldn't negatively affect revenue that we could uh, kind of put our teeth into that would uh, rebuild what's there, including maybe something that would uh, tax electric vehicles? So uh, first, I, I do want to emphasize that, that the, uh, uh, when the president asked Congress to consider the gas tax holiday, he called for a, a means of doing it that would hold harmless the Highway Trust Fund. Uh, but certainly the, 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 the larger point is well taken, that uh, uh, as we continue the transition toward electric vehicles and zero emitting vehicles, it means that uh, we're going to need to have other means for, for uh, filling gaps in the Highway Trust Fund. Uh, up until now, Congress has been prepared to do that through general fund transfers. That's certainly a legitimate uh, way to, to, to fund our highway needs. Uh, it's not the only way, and it's not consistent with the past practice of, uh, of a user pays principle. Uh, how to enact an alternative. These are the kinds of things that uh, the FAST Act uh, law provided for exploring in the pilots. Some states have, have begun doing that. And pursuant to IIJA, there can be more work in that regard, too. I think that will get us more technical insights. Uh, but I think ultimately this will be not a technical decision, but a policy one. Uh, and that, that largely comes down to whether Congress will continue to uh, hold to the user pays principle or seek an alternative means for funding. Have you considered some sort of toll facility, which every vehicle would pay if they had to go through the toll, toll booth? Uh, is that something that's an option? 
You know, I grew up in northern Indiana where 8090 is, uh, is funded as a toll road, and, and uh, certainly that's something I think we're, we're accustomed to on uh, certain heavily trafficked roads, especially if they were built or, or maintained with that in mind. I think it's, it's tougher to imagine how that could be implemented on a, on a widespread basis. And so uh, unless we, we could think of uh, a non-intrusive way to, to, to do that, I, I think it'll be uh, always something that's restricted to more specific and high traffic points, bridges and certain highways, than something that could answer how the road system writ large is, is funded. So how about using private money to do that? Using highway money to erect the toll booths? No, pri private money. Like oh, sorry, I thought you said highway money. Private investment. We do think that uh, you know there, there continues to be a place for for private investment, um, and uh, uh, you know if you look at uh, some of the work our Build America Bureau has done to unlock some of that private value, it, it holds a lot of promise. Uh, I would be less confident that that could answer uh, a question as as large scale as how to keep the highway trust fund in order. Thank you very much. Yield back. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Representative Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Secretary, I thank you for coming before the committee and for in your introductory remarks recognizing the outstanding service of our chair, of our former chair, Mr. Young, who was a dear friend, uh, and the work of this committee. Last time I think we spoke, you called me about supporting the bill from the Senate, and I was told you I couldn't do it because I was supportive of my chairman and the hard work of this committee. Forget about all that. I voted for the bill. Um, we had a hearing last week on the, highlighting the impact of outdated road design in the, in the high, highway safety crisis. We learned the speed as a factor, uh, both in increasing the risk of crashes and, and the severity. Certain high crash risks are, are locations are responsible for a disproportionate number of fatalities and serious injuries. Uh, Memphis, unfortunately, was recently rated the third worst city for pedestrian injuries uh, and accidents. Senator Markey and I got the Complete Streets Act uh, uh, passed uh, and as part of the, uh, and got it into the Jobs Act, and so a so certain percentage of money has to go toward those projects. How will Complete Streets planning initiatives included in the Jobs Act uh, change the way we design our roadways and prioritize safety and access for all users over speed? Well, as you correctly point out, speed is a factor in so many of the roadway fatalities that we experience in the U.S. Uh, and having a, uh, an approach to road design that, that recognizes that uh, not only what's in the car, not only who's in the car, but the road itself and how it's designed can play a major role in uh, safety. We think we have a, a safety responsibility to, uh, to support complete streets. And indeed, uh, there are a number of provisions in the bipartisan infrastructure law, as you know, uh, that encourage uh, state, tribal, and local governments to, to develop complete street standards or policies and, and plans that prioritize complete streets projects. I, I would point also to the, uh, the, the economic benefits of that. Certainly it was my own experience in, in my hometown where we applied what, what you could think of as a complete streets treatment to a downtown thoroughfare and saw a lot of benefit to small business from there being uh, more foot traffic because people felt safer walking along the street once it had uh, gone through those, those upgrades. Um, we have delivered the uh, report to Congress that was called for, uh, called Moving to a Complete Streets Design Model, which offers the Federal Highway Administration's guidance and identifies uh, some of the resources that can be helpful here. We don't aim to prescribe uh, all of the uh, details about what makes for a good complete street. We know that local uh, jurisdictions will come up with their own ideas, but we wanted to provide a framework and provide support. And I would also emphasize, among other uh, funding sources that would be a, a legitimate uh, uh, application for, for uh, complete streets, you know, certainly with the uh, Safe Streets and Roads for All program, which is a billion dollars annually over the next five years, uh, I think that's one area where a, a well-considered Complete Streets uh, plan will score quite well. Thank you, sir. I, I just hope that you would concentrate or put specific focus on road quarters that are the most serious uh, problems based on high risk, and of course that would include Memphis, but I, I know you'll do that. Can I go to a lightning rod round here? Uh, passenger rail is important for the people in my city and my state. We'd like to connect Memphis and Nashville. Those are two of the iconic large cities in the South that are not connected while most are. Are there funds uh, that are in the, the bill that would help Tennessee pursue inner city passenger rail service between Nashville and Memphis? 
Certainly, uh, the, the bill providing for uh, greater investment in passenger rail than we've seen since, since the inception of Amtrak uh, certainly contains funds where uh, I would uh, expect that uh, anyone with a vision for inner city rail like that will, uh, will be interested in applying, and we'll be interested to see what I hope you'll help. I don't know if you're a fan of country music or not, but country music says there's more songs about leaving Nashville and more songs about going to Memphis than anything else. <laughs> so it would be an important corridor. Um, airports are important, too. And unfortunately, we do not have a direct flight from Memphis to Nashville any longer because we're no longer a hub city. Uh, we applied for an airport grant, and I appreciate your nonpartisanship in giving $5 million to Chattanooga and getting that money out, but it detoured. It didn't get to Memphis. Uh, can you give me some kind of an idea about what Memphis might be able to do to receive a second round funding? Our airport is older. It needs in a, it's in a seismic zone with this Madrid fault and, and possible uh, uh, earthquake. And uh, we have a very poor population and, and a low income. Memphis is an ideal city to get help. Uh, can, can you give me some idea about how Memphis might receive that? Uh, yes, uh, there are several funds that, that have become available through the infrastructure law in addition to the ongoing uh, availability of the airport improvement program. And so uh, would, would certainly uh, welcome excuse me, applications from uh, those applicants who didn't uh, make it in the last round of the airport terminal program. Uh, we've got several more rounds to go, and uh, it was uh, certainly uh, oversubscribed. We'd love to fund as many of those projects as we can, as well as depending. That, that's, that's where most of the passenger-facing investments would be, uh, out, out of the airport terminal program. Uh, but for other improvements from tarmac to apron to, to runway to, uh, to tower, uh, there are a lot of uh, additional resources now available thanks to the infrastructure law that uh, could also be uh, areas where uh, they might want to apply. Thank you. My time's expired, but I want to re-thank you for coming to Memphis when the bridge closed down and for visiting FedEx and for getting part of the underrides bill uh, and implementing it in, in the uh, Bipartisan Act. Thank, thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Rep Representative Massey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Buttigieg, I've been driving an electric car for 10 years, and I've had solar panels for 15 years, and I'm really bullish on technology and the way it could help make our country energy independent or more energy independent. But I'm really alarmed at sort of the naivete of those who are uh, promoting rapid adoption of these technologies with our existing infrastructure. President Biden signed a non-binding executive order stating that 50% of, of vehicles sold in the United States should be electric by 2030. Do you support that? Yes. And he also said that by 20, 2035 that 100% uh, of the federal fleet, federal government fleet should be electric. Do you support that? Yes. So um, which uses more electricity? We're talking about residential electricity here. A refrigerator when it's running or an electric car when it's charging in your garage? I would expect a car. Uh, would you say it uses twice as much or 25 times as much? I would think closer to 25 times as much, yeah. It's, it's actually 50 uh, in, at the instantaneous moment, mm -hmm. but over the course of a year, if I take the numbers from the U.S. Department of Energy about the average household, how many vehicles they own and how far they drive, over the course of a year, uh, an American household would use 25 times as much electricity for their electric car as they would for their refrigerator uh, if they had 100% adoption. If, if and the average family has two vehicles, and this would be if the average family had two electric vehicles. Do you think it would strain the grid if everybody plugged in 25 refrigerators in every household? Well, if we didn't make any upgrades to the grid, sure. I mean, if we had yesterday's grid with tomorrow's cars, it's not going to work. It's one of the reasons why we believe that infrastructure includes electrical infrastructure and argued for that to be included, as it thankfully was in the bipartisan law. Do you, do you think by 2030, which is when Biden says 50% of uh, cars sold should be electric, do you think the grid will be capable of handling electric cars? It's going to need to be, and we're working with the Department of Energy every day. We've established a joint office of energy and transportation to map out some of the needs. Obviously, some of this gets outside of my lane, and we've been discussing with, uh, for example, the truck stops that are uh, looking at what their power needs would need to be at an interchange where today uh, they're, you know, they're mainly filling up on gas in order to accommodate that. And then, as you mentioned, a lot of the scenario for this is also residential. Uh, but it's also worth pointing out that uh, while a typical driver uh, who adopts electric is using more electricity, at the end of the day, they're using less energy because of the efficiency benefits 
of getting that energy produced at utilities. The problem is of we don't, we don't have the, the capacity car. to produce that energy. You aptly used the word need. You could say want as well. It, there's needs and wants to make this fantasy work by 2030, but the reality is the capability is not going to be there. The average uh, household uses 17% of their electricity for air conditioning, and um, that would mean the average household uses 1,870 kilowatt hours per year for air conditioning. If that average household plugged in electric cars, do you know how much more electricity they would use in comparison to the air conditioning that air conditions their whole house? No, but again, I would emphasize it will well, let be me help less you. Let me help overall. you with that first before we go on because the numbers are important. It would take four times as much electricity to charge the average household's cars as the average household uses on air conditioning. Do you think that could be, so if we reach the goal by 2030 that Biden has of 50% of adoption instead of 100% adoption, that means the average household would use twice as much electricity charging one of their cars as they would use for all of the air conditioning that they use for the entire year. Do you think this could contribute to rolling uh, blackouts and brownouts in areas of the country where air conditioning is basically considered essential? Not if we prepare. Look, the fact that people who have electric vehicles are going to use more electricity can't be a reason to give up. The idea that America is inferior to the other countries that have figured this out just doesn't sit well with us in administration, I'm, and that's I'm not why saying, we're investing I, in a better I'm, grid. In the time that I have left, let me say, uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't prepare. I told you at the beginning of this, I'm bullish on, on this technology, but the, the numbers and the rate of adoption has been developed using political science, not engineering. They're impractical, and if we blindly follow these goals that Biden has set out, it will cause pain and suffering for the middle class. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Uh, Representative Johnson. Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and uh, good to see you, Secretary Buttigieg. Thank you for your time and your testimony. Uh, for decades, communities of color and low-income communities have been ill-served by our transportation system. Our communities face a higher burden of pollution and fewer affordable, safe transportation options. One means to address this is to build more high quality transit lines, such as the Atlanta Area Transit Agency MARTA's proposal for the South Lake Bus Rapid Transit Project, which will serve an area made up of 93% minority individuals. The South Lake South Lake BRT project is, the, is in the pipeline for the Federal Capital Investment Grants Program. The Federal Transit Administration is currently developing new guidance for the SIG program, which will significantly influence which projects qualify and receive funding in the future. Mr. Secretary, how will your department ensure this new guidance and the SIG program generally will support equity and deliver real results for underserved communities? We're certainly committed to considering equity and uh, other important criteria that belong within the framework of our, our, our transit policy. And when it comes to CIG, which is among the largest competitive federal grant programs, uh, we recognize there's a lot at stake. The president's budget requests $2.9 billion dollars in general funds for CIG, and additional funds in the amount of $1.6 billion are provided through the advance appropriations that came in the IAJA. So that's a total of $4.5 billion to work with. Uh, this is also a, a program that requires projects to go through a, a, an extensive uh, uh, process to ensure that they are uh, going to effectively use those, those taxpayer dollars. And the evaluation criteria include things like consideration of affordable housing in the transit corridor, credit for projects that serve transit dependent populations, and incentives to use alternative fuel vehicles and, and build environmentally friendly facilities. Uh, so you have my commitment that as we uh, continue with the process of 
updating the CIG program regulation to uh, make sure that the guidance reflects the, the changes that came by way of the infrastructure law. And, and the initial changes are out for uh, notice and, uh, and comment. Uh, we'll continue to uh, consider these and, uh, uh, and other important uh, values and, and criteria uh, to the extent that the law provides for us to do so. Thank you. And Mr. Secretary, the House recently passed an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act that I authored, which relates to the disadvantaged business enterprise program applicable to highway transit and safety programs. The amendment eliminates the gross receipts cap in effect for DBEs working on sur surface transportation projects. This amendment ensures that the definition of a DBE is consistent across DOT programs as it brings surface transportation online uh, in line with how the FAA defines a DBE and ensures that DOT <laughs> follows SBA definitions for a small business. Do you support the elimination of the gross receipts cap for surface transportation programs? And also what additional steps in your department taking uh, is your department taking to promote maximum participation by DBEs in DOT programs? Well, first of all, yes, we, we support that step. We, we recognize that the SBA's government-wide uh, small business size standards are, are more accurate and consistent uh, in terms of measuring a, a small business. And so uh, we, we think this can address something that we hear uh, uh, very often as a concern from, from DBE owners who, as one uh, business leader put it to me, feel that they they are sometimes viewed in such a way that they become too small to be big and, and too big to be small. Uh, and we are within days of uh, publishing our own uh, notice of proposed rulemaking uh, with a number of updates and amendments to our program rules to modernize and, and improve the DBE program. We want it to be uh, more user friendly while maintaining the highest standards of program integrity. And, uh, and look forward to uh, getting public comment on, uh, on that proposed rule as, as soon as it's out. Uh, I'll also say in addition to the uh, formal requirements and, and rules pursuant to the program, we're also just doing a lot of engagement and communication, making sure the DBE community knows about the opportunities that are coming and understands where to go in order to become more involved. And we'll be engaging the, uh, uh, the uh, incumbent and larger firms as well about what we consider to be the importance of them being good partners with these smaller and disadvantaged companies too. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Representative Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm sure you know, folks, where I live, my bosses, my constituents are paying about 80% more for gasoline than they were when President Biden became the president. And I think the response, I mean, I think, I think it's fair to say that even you have implied that they should buy an electric vehicle and absolve themselves of that 80% increase per gallon. Just looking at Kelly Blue Book, the price of a EV is about $55,000. Now, that doesn't include, so there, it's actually more than that because there's $7,500 uh, per car uh, subsidy paid for by about $48 billion in taxes on the same people um, on that car. So it's closer to about $60,000, which is about $20,000 more than a, a gas-driven uh, passenger car, about $40,000 more than the average compact car. Um, at the same time, I'm sure you probably also realize that well, uh, the average Pennsylvanian pays about $170 a month in electricity, um, and that doesn't include the 10 to 15 percent that it that has just gone up. So that's an old number. So it's actually more than that. And based on Mr. Massey's numbers, which I don't I don't doubt at all, if they could afford the electric vehicle and plug it in, we're talking about another $90, $100 a month in electric costs. I'm wondering what the administration and you are doing other than subsidizing, other than subsidizing, to, um, to lower the cost. Look, they're either paying more for gas, 80%, or they're paying more for electricity to the tune of essentially doubling their electricity bill. Like, how's this getting better for my bosses? And what, what's the administration, like, what do you plan to do about that cost other than subsidies? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'm very glad you asked that question. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I want to be clear. Nobody I know, certainly not me, thinks that all or even most Americans can easily afford electric vehicles. That said, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by this $55,000 number that, that, that keeps going around. Um, I, pulled, I, I knew this might come up, so I just pulled a few of the latest prices. Uh, a Chevy Bolt, so an American-made 2022 uh, EV is $26,595. Uh, if you want a pickup truck, uh, like a Chevy Silverado EV or Ford uh, F-150 Lightning, uh, the starting prices of those are $39,900 and $39,974, respectively. Is We've that, also pre, begun is that see, pre-subsidy or post-subsidy? Uh, you know, I think it depends on which uh, it depends does that on the include, automaker, because some of them have gone through the cap for the 7,500, and some. Does that of them include have not. Sta- state subsidies as well? I don't think so. No. Okay. So, uh, and, and look, that that's uh, you know the new car. So the first time I got a plug-in car, for example, Chaston and I got one. It was uh, fourteen thousand uh, dollars. Had about fifteen thousand miles on it. It was a C-Max. Uh, so it was a combo uh, plug-in hybrid. But the, what we're seeing in terms of the dynamics now is we're close to the point and may actually be there on certain models and under certain circumstances where the extent to which your car payment would go up is actually already outweighed by the extent to which your gas bill would go down, even factoring in the cost of electricity. Now, again, that depends on uh, what electricity So you're saying the rate. market's bringing it down. It, it, look, I got my numbers from Kelly Blue Book. So um, Are those this year's yeah. numbers? What's that? Would those be actually, this year's actually last year? So, oh. um, so, but I don't know that anything, especially used cars, have actually gone down in price. But my other concern is, is that I'm sure, if you're not aware, that you should be aware that about uh, since 2010, so it's, it's essentially over 12 years now, we've closed over 550 uh, power generation stations, which is about 102 gigawatts, and we're scheduled to retire another by 2025, so just a couple of years, 17 gigawatts of coal-fired capacity. Um, at the same time, we're asking Americans through subsidies and through their purchases to pay for China, who has, I think you wouldn't argue, 80 to 90 percent market share of everything that goes into an electric vehicle right, into an electric vehicle at the same time we're essentially reducing power and using Thomas's numbers, which I think are correct, we're going to increase the grid requirement by at least 50 percent, which none of that, none of that really works out. You look at a country like Ghana, who's shutting the lights off now because they followed this model that we're following right now. What's the administration and what are you doing to make it easier and more affordable to mine critical minerals in the United States to support this industry? One thing we've been working on with the Department of Energy is better sourcing of some of the elements that go into batteries, for example, Uh, ideally in the United States, and if not in the United States, then in geopolitically friendlier territory. Now, some of this isn't just the mining, right? Some of it's actually the refining capacity, uh, which uh, is to China's advantage, and we've got to change that. I guess our view is we shouldn't accept that as a given. Yeah, China, China refines okay, 90% of the we, manganese. We, are we going to we bring are, that to the o- United States? We'd love to bring that the refinement capacity uh, more to U.S. and friendly countries. Okay. Thank you. I ran out of time. Uh, at this point, uh, I'll ask questions, and Rodney Davis will ask questions, and then we're going to recess for votes. Um, so, uh, Mr. Secretary, um, You know, I I just want to clarify the issue of the guidance, which uh, caused a a bit of a stir when you issued the the guidance uh, on uh, building a better America. We called it Fix It First in uh, the legislation that passed out of the House. Um, And let's just get straight on the record. Who makes the decision how to invest uh, a portion of highway dollars? Is it the, uh, the feds or the state DOTs? It's up to the state DOTs. Okay. Uh, does anything in their guidance change that? No. Okay. Uh, have you proposed to eliminate eligibility for certain types of highway construction projects? No. Uh, does DOT propose to take away formula or discretionary money from states who add new highway lane capacity? No. Uh, are you forcing any states to build transit or active transportation projects uh, over uh, highway projects? Forcing? No. Um, I do remember your memorable exchange when uh, Ms. Capito, a uh, former member of this committee, asked you before the Senate why you were doing this, and you said, well, ma'am, because it's, it's good policy. 
uh, which I support. Uh, we want people just to think these things through. It's not a mandate, but think about it um, as you move forward uh, instead of you know, doing the same thing again and again and again, which doesn't work. Uh, we induce more demand, we build more lane miles, we induce more demand, we build more lane miles, and we end up with the same congestion in the end. Uh, and then uh, secondly, uh, there's been some controversy about uh, your proposed rulemaking uh, on uh, tracking greenhouse gas uh, emissions from uh, on-road on uh, on sources. Now, um, I remember the day when states were allowed to set negative safety targets. Uh, now you have uh, performance management rules in areas such as asset management, bridge and pavement conditions, and safety. Um, has requiring states to set targets and measure their own progress toward these desirable goals uh, helped focus attention and investment? We think it has. I would describe that as good policy, too. Okay. Um, then uh, just on, you know, the, uh, the exchange uh, about uh, EVs and that, um, you know, I, I don't know what we're going to do with all the mechanics, uh, and that's something we have to start thinking about. Uh, but the life cycle cost of an EV is significantly less than a fossil fueled uh, vehicle. Um, you know, when, the, when uh, it was penciled out for the post office, uh, unfortunately the current postmaster general doesn't agree, um, they would have saved a phenomenal amount of money uh, even though there was more upfront cost if they had moved to an EV fleet. So I, I think that's something that needs to be taken uh, into account. Uh, so I thank you. I thank you for your testimony. And now I turn to uh, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Secretary. Great to see you again. It was great uh, seeing you at DCA uh, right. last week and had a chance to, to chat with you there. I wish I'd have seen you when Congressman Boss and I were on our never-ending journey to try and get out of LaGuardia mm -hmm. last night, but uh, we didn't get a chance to do that. But it is always good to talk transportation and we appreciate you being here today. I, I would mention, uh, I was gonna ask you about the, the uh, policy uh, on using bipartisan infrastructure law resources to build a better America that Chairman DeFazio asked you about. I, I hope you, ha you were pretty clear in your response to him. I hope that clarification is given to our states because there's still some confusion. We have them reaching out to us, wondering what your intention was. So thank you for that clarification. But moving that out to the states uh, would, would be beneficial too. Uh, IJA also includes uh, my provision I helped craft here in the House, the One Federal Decision Act, and that would streamline federal environmental reviews, as you know. I've talked to Mayor Landrew about this. Um, many of my colleagues are worried about getting those dollars out the door. You can't do that without streamlining the review process. Uh, what's going on there, the deadlines, including for uh, consulting agencies regarding categorical exclusions. Can you please update me on implementing one federal decision? Thanks. Uh, yeah, we recognize the importance of uh, a swift and, and prompt process as things are going through, uh, especially federal requirements on, on permitting. Uh, and as our, uh, the earlier exchange uh, um, highlighted, that's even more important in an environment with inflation uh, adding to the consequence of things taking any longer than they have to. Uh, with regard to the consulting that you mentioned, our department got to work right away on that. Uh, it effectively allows uh, one department to engage in other departments' categorical, categorical exclusions when they qualify. Uh, so as called for in, in the legislation, uh, DOT completed a review of uh, our categorical exclusions. We found uh, uh, four areas where we could, uh, we could collaborate with other departments. Uh, accelerating the process on uh, projects, especially they're helpful with uh, things like post-disaster resilience. Uh, and uh, that's, of course, just one of the requirements pursuant to the one federal uh, decision provisions in the law. We are committed to making sure that we address all of them. Sure. I, I, I would en envision if the majority changes here in the House, any legislation that is passed into law would likely have more environmental, uh, environmental review provisions like one federal decision. So implementing it with IGEN now, could be a barometer in how you do it in the future, too. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, Amtrak has laid out some ambitious goals. Last year, it released a Connect U.S. plan that outlined a 15-year strategy for expansion that would, according to it, connect dozens of city pairs. Of the corridors mentioned in its 15-year strategy, are you aware that any are ready to move forward and be put into action? 
So uh, uh, if I'm recalling correctly, the uh, quarters are laid out in such a way that some of them are an expansion of service on existing physically sure, constructed sure. lines. Others would require more work. Uh, I don't have handy the timeline of which could be ready by when, but uh, my understanding is it's a mix of things that could be done relatively quickly and things that would take more extensive work. So when you say relatively quickly, have has Amtrak or anyone at your agency done any environmental reviews for some of these uh, these proposed routes? So depending on the route, we'd have to see if it would qualify. I think often it could qualify for a CE because it'd be along existing uh, right away, but uh, uh, I don't know that we have gotten as far as any uh, new uh, right of way being proposed and ready for uh, for an EIS or something like that. So if you don't have a new right of way, you, you probably haven't reached any agreements with landowners on any of the proposals. Uh, I haven't seen it advance to okay. that level yet. If you have, will you get back to our, sure. have your team get back to us? Sure. Um, also, I, I know you get lots of letters of support for the raise grants. Uh, clearly, I know you think mine are the best, so I want to just remind you of a couple that I've sent uh, to your agency. The city of Decatur and Macon County uh, has a Brush College Road and Ferries Parkway project. Springfield, mm. high-speed rail project between Chicago and St. Louis. Uh, Springfield has done a great job in leveraging federal resources to actually combine three tracks in, or two tracks into one in and around Springfield. They have usable seg two more usable segments, one raise grant and one MPDG grant application. Terminal Rail Association of St. Louis with the multimodal freight yard expansion in Venice, McLean County, Route 66, bike and pedestrian trail. And in Edwardsville, we have the Goshen Road and Liberty Trail multimodal transportation improvement projects. I will get you a list of those so you don't have to write them down. I'd appreciate your consideration and any updates. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, since uh, we have uh, votes on the floor of the House, uh, the, the committee shall stand in recess and we will return and start again as quickly as possible.
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Is this getting it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Audio test one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Sky Harbor Airport received a bill grant for its Northside Rail expansion project to allow the airport to meet its growing needs. 
However, as you know, a series of challenges stemming from various departmental requirements have hindered progress, and as a result, the airport is seeking to scale the project to focus solely on the 24th Street overpass. Because the obligation date for the grant is rapidly approaching, the airport is at high risk of losing these critical federal funds. Mr. Secretary, this project is important to the City of Phoenix and to Sky Harbor's future growth. Will your department support our efforts to extend the period of eligibility for the grant and work with the airport on this modified project so it does not lose these critical federal funds? So our, our goal, of course, is for every grant recipient to uh, succeed when, uh, uh, when funds are awarded. In this case, uh, it was uh, 2019 funding. Uh, I believe the, the issue here had to do with meeting the, the obligation deadline uh, with the proposed change in scope that they had. But we'd be happy to uh, follow up and engage your staff to explore anything we can do to be supportive in the, in the context. We really appreciate working closely with you to re make sure we retain those critically important federal funds. Arizona is one of the fastest growing states in the nation, and we have real transportation needs. To meet these demands of our growing population, we must invest in our interstate highways. Interstate 10 is a key corridor connecting Phoenix and Tucson, yet there is still a large section that is only two lanes, creating tra traffic bottlenecks for the more than 110,000 vehicles per day that utilize it. And we need new highways to move commerce and people like Interstate 11 to link the last two metropolitan areas in the country, Phoenix and Las Vegas, that are not connected by an interstate. Arizona has committed resources to the next phase of, for the environmental work, environmental work for Interstate 11 and is investing $400 million in Interstate 10 to expand capacity to address safety concerns, improvement, improving the movement of goods and people, and to increase access to the Gila River Indian community. But Arizona cannot meet these growing needs on its own. It does need a strong federal partner. Mr. Secretary, do you agree that the mega grant program should focus on projects of this size and scope, like the expansion of I-10 and construction of I-11, that cannot be done by state by the state alone with its annual formula formula dollars, dollars excuse me, to ensure the federal government is a full partner on these projects that have impacts on regional and national mobility and commerce? Thank you. Certainly the intent uh, of the mega program and our goal in administering it is to make sure that uh, projects that are too large or too complex in their scope to be supported through traditional means uh, uh, very much uh, too large to be shouldered by a state alone uh, get the federal support to help see them through. And so while uh, taking care, of course, not to prematurely comment on any application, uh, I would certainly say that uh, we intend to be supportive of as many qualifying projects as we can, uh, knowing that uh, the, the scales that, uh, that you see with, with some of these efforts are exactly why it was necessary to have an additional source of funding as provided in IAJA over and above what we've had to work with in the past. All right, Mr. Secretary, I want to talk about one final issue, and that is passenger rail service. Phoenix is the largest city in the United States without access to passenger rail service. As other communities have gained access to passenger rail, they've experienced significant new economic opportunity. But my state, unfortunately, has missed out. I'm hopeful that will change, and there is reason for optimism. Amtrak has proposed connecting Arizona's two large and fast-growing metropolitan areas, Phoenix and Tucson, with frequent and reliable passenger rail service. Mr. Secretary, in your opinion, what can we do to best support the Tucson-Phoenix-West Valley rail line? Well, uh, uh, the framework that I think will allow us to, uh, uh, to, to support efforts like this is the, the, the fact that the overall funding for passenger rail includes a, a, a set of funds that is specifically for looking beyond the Northeast Corridor. Of course, a lot of the attention is on the Northeast Corridor, but a lot of the need is elsewhere. Uh, so the, the FRA has issued a framework for a uh, corridor identification and development program. This came out in May, and uh, the first project pipeline should be uh, issued within a year, so, so next May. Uh, and that's one of the places I think would be natural to look in the context of the uh, federal-state partnership that got uh, extraordinarily uh, 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 enhanced funding through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. I've had the pleasure of arriving uh, by uh, train in Flagstaff and certainly <laughs> understand why there's a need and appetite for that kind of service further south. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, my time is completed, so now the next up will be Congressman Babin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Graves. Uh, I want to thank you for your time today, Mr. Secretary. 
Uh, Mr. Secretary, despite the administration's best efforts, uh, oil and gas don't seem to be going anywhere but higher. Uh, so if you really wanted to help Americans move and move our transportation goods, uh, I would think that you might want to consider uh, right now as working with the president to combat high gas prices. That's number one. And doing something doesn't mean blaming President Putin of Russia or begging the Saudi crown prince for relief or calling the oil and gas uh, companies of America evil and stifling their produ uh, production. However, instead of calling on the president, who is your boss, to do everything in his power to address skyrocketing gas prices, uh, I've heard you prioritize the use of taxpayer dollars to push a message of social justice, fighting racist highways and equity and transportation. And I'm struggling to square your priorities with economic reality that we're facing in the United States today. You say communities of color are oppressed by racist roads, and while at the same time, you're ignoring the fact that these same people are being disproportionately oppressed by rising gas prices. In fact, it's fair to say this administration is directly burdening uh, low-income families since they're taking the brunt of massive economic challenges that we're facing today. And Mr. Secretary, you've recommended that Americans who cannot afford six gallon, uh, a $6 gallon of gas should buy a, an electric vehicle. And uh, I'm going by the Kelly Blue Book of $55,000, but even at your statement a while ago at $39,000, uh, I'm not sure how you can justify making that ask uh, to folks who can barely provide for their families, especially black and Hispanic households bringing in an average of forty-five dollars and $55,000 respectively per year. Uh, how on earth would they be able to buy a car that costs almost as much as they make in one year? And uh, I really think that uh, if you want to, to do something, I think we need somebody who is serving as secretary that would be laser focused on supporting transportation capabilities and not pushing social agendas in this country uh, from your position. Uh, we have serious issues going on in the United States flight cancellations, worker shortages, sky-high fuel prices, unprecedented supply chain challenges. But unfortunately, I see uh, more headlines about your positions and stances on abortion and on your thoughts on gun rights uh, than I do on plans to improve our transportation and our infrastructure. Uh, I think Americans want lower gas prices and policies that will end this inflation and this uh, economic hardship that we have today not a woke social agenda, uh, such as a billion dollar pilot program that you launched last month to combat, quote, combat racially disconnected roads. That's a billion dollars, and that's a billion dollars right out of the taxpayer's money. And I think Americans know uh, that, uh, that uh, your administration, that the Biden administration uh, have mismanaged much of this, of our natural resources, our economic uh, activities and uh, sound policies, uh, which has caused this inflation and pushed us to the verge of a recession, which we are teetering on right now. It certainly appears to be a dereliction of duty on the part of many in, that administ in this administration to favor foreign nations over our own. Frankly, I don't think the price of gas is an accident. I believe that it's part of an agenda designed to fundamentally change the way our energy and transportation sectors work together. And unfortunately, that is an agenda that leaves American superiority in the dust. And it's an agenda that empowers China and Russia and the <coughs> Middle East. And Mr. Secretary, I do have a few questions that I'd like to submit for the record, because we're just about out of time. And I look forward to your department's response. I want to thank you again for being here. I appreciate that. And I think that the American people deserve a lot better than what we're getting uh, right now with our economy. And with that, I'll yield back. Thank you. I was going to give the secretary maybe a minute to respond if you'd like to. Sure. I just want to address a factual uh, uh, inaccuracy in your question that I think is important. Uh, you began by saying that uh, gas prices have only gone up. Uh, you'll be relieved to hear that they have gone down every single day for the last several weeks. And I believe that's connected to the aggressive actions that the president has taken to reduce gas prices for Americans. 
Of course, we want that price to go lower. It needs to. We're all feeling the effects at the pump. That's why we don't agree with the idea that it's okay to let Putin off the hook for his activities or to let oil and gas executives off the hook for their stated intention of not increasing production at a time of extraordinary profits. Uh, I have never suggested that it would be easy for all Americans to afford electric vehicles, although, again, I would point that to the fact that the first EV I ever had was uh, about $14,000. Uh, but we think that policy measures can make it more affordable, and we hope that uh, uh, members uh, in, uh, in this body will reconsider their opposition to making EVs cheaper through tax credits. Thank you very much. Next up will be Congressman Carson. Thank you, Chairman, um, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, uh, for uh, participating today, also uh, representing uh, the great Hoosier State uh, quite well. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Mr. Secretary, um, I'm very proud uh, to represent Beach Grove, Indiana, uh, which is one of the most important rail maintenance facilities uh, in the country. And unfortunately, there have been more reports of efforts to effectively downsize or outsource um, maintenance to improve uh, the quality of passenger service. Uh, we need to improve Amtrak's national uh, fleet, no doubt about it. Um, I'm, I'm certain, and I'd love for the committee to hear your efforts, sir, to uh, continue the support to strengthen the, the great work that's being done at Beach Grove and oppose any efforts to outsource this work uh, are there particular updates or insights you can share, sir? Well, for anything concerning the uh, operational outlook for, for Amtrak, I, I would have to uh, uh, refer you to, to Amtrak leadership, but uh, certainly recognize uh, the importance of, of the work that uh, workers at this facility do to uh, keep our trains operating and, and operating safely, uh, and uh, would uh, welcome any opportunity to work with your office on providing further information about how some of the funding coming toward Amtrak uh, from the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act can be applied in ways that will uh, create a lot of work opportunity, uh, as well as a lot of uh, improvements for passengers, both in terms of the rolling stock and, and the maintenance, uh, and then, of course, in terms of the day-to-day -day service. Yes, sir. Uh, also, we're, we're looking forward to uh, working with you on our targeted outreach for the bipartisan infrastructure bill, especially through our Congressional Black Caucus Transportation Brain Trust later uh, uh, in the fall, um, we, we want to take we want to make sure the the historic investments you mentioned reach disadvantaged communities and minority businesses. And I know our staffs are working together on those details. Uh, secondly, and lastly, I'm very concerned about the worsening problems of blocked rail crossings, especially in places like downtown Indianapolis, where major intersections have been blocked for hours. Uh, this is a very serious safety concern that, that really impacts urban and rural areas. Um, I believe there has to be more that needs to be done uh, uh, statutorily uh, to address this issue. Mr. Secretary, do you agree uh, those additional authorities could, could help alleviate uh, the frequency of, of block crossings? And what more can our committee do to address this issue? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we would welcome uh, further opportunities to work on uh, the issue of, of railroad crossings, uh, both uh, uh, the uh, effects that happen when they're blocked and the safety concerns that they present. I want to thank you for uh, the support for the uh, infrastructure law, which provides for the railroad crossing elimination program. We're uh, hard at work uh, getting those dollars ready because we know that that's going to have a benefit, uh, as you mentioned, uh, both for rural and urban communities alike, where people have had that experience of, uh, of being blocked or delayed by a crossing, but also, uh, uh, in addition, of course, to the economic and convenience effect, the simple uh, safety dividend of having fewer such crossings. Highway rail grade crossing incidents and trespassing uh, have contributed to 900 deaths in uh, fiscal, 21, uh, fiscal year 2021 alone. Uh, and so we want to do everything that we can to prevent train vehicle collisions uh, and to uh, uh, use the resources that we have to uh, create fewer places where those conflicts can happen in the first place and uh, would uh, uh, certainly appreciate uh, continued attention from Congress on this. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. I yield back, Chairman. Next up will be Congressman Graves from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you for, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, good to see you again. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, excuse me, Mr. Secretary, uh, you and I have spoken in the past about strong concerns we have related to how the administration is prioritizing the allocation of grants. And you have large programs like Infra and RAISE, uh, nearly a billion dollars each. Um, I mentioned to you that, that I had actually written much of the amendment, had negotiated with other members the amendment that puts in law the right criteria for prioritization. So when the administration came out and said that uh, racial equity, climate change, environmental justice, and enhancing union opportunities were going to be the driving factors, I had strong concerns because those are, those are things that y'all are just deciding are priorities. They're not things that are actually in the law. Um, and so then I said, okay, well, we'll wait and see how the, the grants are actually allocated and decide if this is a problem or not. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, I remind you, I represent South Louisiana. We have uh, one of the most at-risk states for uh, sea rise. We have one of the highest African-American populations in the nation. We're at the bottom of the largest watershed taking in runoff from Montana, New York, Canada, and everything that's in that water. Um, and so I think if you go through and look at your criteria, we should be number one, two, and three, uh, really up there at the top. Yet when you allocated funds mm -hmm. under the, um, the infra program, um, I think it was 15% of the money, 15% went to the state of California. Uh, you had about 555 million went to blue states, only 350 million went to red states. Under the RAISE program, $162 million went to bike and uh, pedestrian paths. So I wanna ask you a question. If you look at TomTom, Tom, the navigation company's assessment of, of congestion, most congested areas in America, they said that New York was number one, they said that Los Angeles was number two. They said that Miami was number three. Do you have any idea what number four was or is? I don't. So um, that would be the metropolis of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which puts it ahead of Chicago and uh, San Francisco and a number of other significantly larger places. 62 hours, 62 hours a year, time lost just sitting in traffic. No one would have expected that that, that be the case. So if you, took, if, if you look at the two grant programs, a billion dollars each, you would think that with us being the state that should be performing a top under your criteria, top under the criteria that I wrote because I'm incredibly biased, um, yet we got one grant, and this is what it was, $18.5 million to improve fare collection for New Orleans Transit. It's kind of hard to, to, to understand, really hard to reconcile. I tried to get him to find a better snapshot on, uh, on Google Map, map traffic, but um, it's normally dark red. This is the bridge. It's the only place in America where the interstate funnels down to a single lane. And it's not because we were innovative and came up with a great idea that nobody else could think of. It was idiotic and proof is that we have 62 hours we sit around and waste in traffic. And here's the last slide. It's just a picture here showing the bridge that looks like a parking lot because people are just sitting there. This is I-10 connecting California to, to Florida. Uh, so I, I want to ask, how are you prioritizing and how can projects like this not get funded when you're putting money toward bike trails, putting money toward, uh, let's see, transit systems got um, uh, $263 million under one of the programs, over a quarter of the funds, whenever we gave transit tens of billions of dollars during the COVID relief packages. The, the highways didn't get anything. So I guess I'm, I'm just trying to understand what are we doing and why aren't we putting money toward true national priorities that will relieve congestion, reduce emissions, improve time saved in traffic and other things that I think we would share. Well, our shared priorities, I think, are very well served by the things that we funded in the INFRA program and in the RAISE program. But uh, I'll acknowledge that for every dollar we were able to give out, there were probably about 10 that applied. So we had a lot of worthy projects, many, I'm sure, uh, from your district or your state and from all around the country, uh, which qualified, but uh, we had to, uh, we were only able to, to work with the funding that we had. Of course, thanks to the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, we have more funding than before which means we'll be able to say yes more often. And we love nothing more than saying yes to a good project or a good program. Uh, I think if we start ranking you know, how much is going to highways, we need to include the highway formula funds uh, in that, right? which is the, the, the bulk of uh, the dollars that go to those purposes. And you have, of course, certain things like CMAQ that are you know, specifically by the very core of the program directed toward congestion mitigation, although there's no reason why that can't be a benefit coming off something like a, a raise grant or, uh, or another piece of, of legislation. I will say you know, one of the things we tried to do is 
really make sure that uh, these dollars in infra, for example, got around the country regardless of, uh, uh, certainly regardless of politics. And, and one thing we we're proud of is I think there was a, a 25% floor for, for rural projects. We did almost double that. We were in the, in the 40s uh, on supporting rural communities. Uh, I know that, that for every project we're able to say yes to, there's, there's several more that uh, would be, uh, folks would be disappointed we couldn't get All there. Right. But again, this, thanks this, to this interview. Secretary, I'm out of time, and I appreciate yes you being here and answering the questions. I look forward to following up with you on this, and I would like to ask, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay, if you could please provide the committee with the metrics for how you have measured those four criteria that I, I mentioned, hey, I would appreciate it. Thank you very much. Next up is Congresswoman Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I want you to know that in Nevada, we share your enthusiasm for uh, the funding that is going into infrastructure. I just point out a couple of things that we're doing. We got $2.5 billion for our roads and highways, $225 million to fix our falling down bridges, $100 million for our high speed Nevada initiative for uh, connecting with the internet and 5.5 million for EV charging stations. That put a lot of people to work, or it will, and it uh, will help us to uh, grow and develop, and we invite you to come out and see any of those projects in the works. You know, we had the highest unemployment in the country at 35%, but we're recovering now at a rapid rate thanks to investments like this. So I hope we'll see you in Nevada. My question, though, I'd like to go back to the, uh, my colleague from Phoenix to talk about inner city passenger rail. I want to just be sure I understand how that partnership grant program is going to work. So much of the investment in rail goes to the Northeast Corridor, but we need to invest in the Southwest as well. They need improvement. We need uh, greater availability. So I want to be sure that this would enable a public entity like Nevada to apply for the grant in partnership with a private uh, inner city passenger rail company. Second, what's the timing for when that application will occur? And third, will you help us and work with me to see that regional uh, impact as opposed to just local impact plays a role in the determination of who gets those grants? Thank you. Uh, to take the last question first, uh, we certainly uh, want to think about the, the regional effect and how any given vision for expanding passenger rail fits into an overall vision for uh, a first-rate uh, passenger rail network serving the entire country. And I know there's a great deal of interest in this in, uh, in the region you represent. Uh, I want to emphasize that under the annual funding of the partnership, uh, the, the state-federal partnership, which gets uh, $36 billion in advance appropriation over the next five years, uh, that uh, not more than $24 billion can be provided to projects that are in the Northeast Corridor. So we, we understand and, and share uh, the goal of Congress to make sure that uh, no one region monopolizes the, the funding. Uh, right now, FRA is working through the applications for the fiscal year 2021 partnership funding, uh, but will uh, later this year be able to uh, uh, make the funding available for the fiscal year 22. Um, they issued uh, just a, a few weeks ago in late June the notice of approach to developing the NEC inventory, uh, but uh, again, the non-NEC program uh, will be made clear, um, the parameters of that will be made clear later on this year. And uh, uh, we certainly welcome the opportunity to uh, work with you and, and work with a project sponsor for, from your region on how to provide uh, service where it uh, could have a very big impact. You know, if you look at I-15 from Los Angeles to Las Vegas on the weekend, it's like a parking lot going one direction or the other. We believe a speed train along that same corridor would carry people in both directions. Uh, it wouldn't just be a gambler's train. People would go south uh, on the train to, to Los Angeles could become a commuter train. It gets cars off the road and improves the air quality. Uh, it would just, we've been studying this for a long time and we're close to making some progress. So we hope to work with you and see that that happens. And I thank you very much. You thank can come you. out there for the groundbreaking. How about that? We'd love it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Next up will be Mr. LaMalfa. Perfect time. Hello, Mr. Secretary. 
afternoon. Welcome to our little event here. Thank you. Um, I'll uh, launch right in here. So um, I'm a member from California, Northern California. And in my home state, we've had this project that was initiated in 2008 by a vote of the people for $9 billion worth of bond funds to go to the high-speed rail to complete a project from San Francisco to LA, right? So over the years, we've found that they fall farther and farther behind and the price goes up and up and up. It was sold to the voters then in 08 as a $33 billion project with the possibility of adding also a Sacramento and this San Diego spur for a little more money later. Well, it's fallen way behind. It was supposed to be completed in uh, 2020, actually, was the original sale that the voters were, were given. And now they hope to have one segment done by 2023. And the price has skyrocketed from the $33 billion that the voters saw on the ballot to a number somewhere around $105 billion. And it was supposed to also draw in a lot of private investment to make up for the difference between the $9 billion and the 33 at the time. So they've been able to lay their hands on or identify a number somewhere around 20, 25 billion maybe for via cap and trade and other things for a $105 billion project. So we're $80 billion short of being able to build it out. And federal government has put forward recently, I think about $2 billion in the recent IIJA and, and about three and a half billion in the 2009 Stimulus Act of 2009. And so here we find ourselves 80 billion short to build out at whatever today's price is of a project that um, currently, if they can complete it in a certain amount of years, who knows, would go from not SF to LA, but Madera to Shafter, Shafter, California, which Madera and Shafter kind of like SF and LA, right? But anyway. I'm pretty tired of this project not uh, meeting any promises and go going way over and such, but I want you to be aware, Mr. Secretary, that um, the, a simple thing like the land acquisitions that are, that are happening in the route, which they haven't identified the whole route yet. They know the easier part from through the valley and South Bay linking up with the North Valley. They don't know how they're going to get it through the Tehachapi's to L.A., but they're not even paying people for the land that they've taken from them through eminent domain. Are you aware of that situation, sir? Uh, you're saying that uh, people have not been compensated for expropriation of their right, land? Right. I would want to see more details about the case here. I'd be happy to supply that with, to you. So, I mean, can you support a federally backed project if it was more federal nexus of taking property without providing the compensation? You, could, you wouldn't do that, would you? Well, any federally funded project would have to comply with uh, all of the law with regard to uh, obviously everything from, from Title VI to making sure people are uh, appropriately accommodated. So again, I'd want to know more. Is, is this the subject of a federal complaint, to your knowledge? Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll look we'll, into we'll it. We'll get back with you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, it's, um, but as, as the prices go up, what, when does the value become not there for the thing. I mean, I, I can see a seller here on the East Coast, high ridership, density of population, that works out, you know, more or less. But here, we're, we're decades behind now by the time we build it out, and the price has uh, at least tripled. Now, if I was had a bid for getting my roof done, they, they told me $33,000, and they show up to start changing shingles, and they said, oh, now it's $105,000, I'd say, I need a different bid. So what, what is, at the end point, what is it, what's right for the taxpayers on this? So the way we view it is that uh, that decision is not entirely up to the federal government. It's largely up to the project sponsor and the people, people of California. As you noted, there's federal money into this, uh, from, especially from the 2009-2010 funds. Uh, but also uh, the state has, has, in its recent budget agreement, I think committed uh, uh, another 4.2. So what we really want to do is make sure that, that we're getting the greatest bang for our federal buck while partnering with, with the state and uh, uh, proceeding as they see fit. They'll be uh, looking to the feds for a lot more because we're about tapped out at the state level. Let me, let me shift gears. I'm sorry. Time always goes yeah. fast. The AB5 implementation, that bill in California, which is basically taking – small truckers and putting them out of business if they're not operating as part of, as an employee of a larger company. 
Uh, have you provided any guidance to the, the truckers in the state about how we're gonna apply with AB5 and not have just a complete loss of those pool of truckers and already the supply chain issues we have? Well, certainly a priority for us is to increase employment in trucking, and we've seen that that, uh, that has, has grown substantially. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, you know, we've been able to uh, uh, engage with, with the different players, uh, but I uh, need to emphasize also that when it comes to the litigation that's going on over this, the, uh, the department is not a party to that. Yeah, I mean, this is, we're talking owner-operators, not necessarily employees. The owner-operators, do they have a place at the table mm -hmm. anymore? Say again? Do the owner-operators have a place at the table anymore, do you see? We certainly think owner-operators are a very important part of the future of trucking, just as they are the present. Okay. Oh, thank you. We have the PRO Act being had in D.C. Oh, I think the, the time is... AB5, but anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you very much, Congressman. Next up will be Congressman Huffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Secretary, uh, it's great to see you. Welcome back to the committee. Uh, let me just tell you how much I've been enjoying your testimony and your answers to questions. Like you, my, my starter EV was a C-Max, not much of a head turner, but very practical. Um, I appreciate your sensibilities and also appreciate the, the calm and factual way you have uh, debunked a few of the things that have been thrown at you by our colleagues, whether it's the price tag of EVs or conspiracy theories about government taking without compensation. Uh, we appreciate your leadership. Uh, one of the great things uh, coming from a coastal California district um, that I believe is in the bipartisan infrastructure, infrastructure laws, the historic investments that allow communities to build greater resilience and adaptation. Uh, and of course, my district is on the front line of climate impacts. So uh, this includes the $8.7 billion from the newly created PROTECT grant program, as well as new eligibility in the National Highway Performance Program to mitigate against sea level rise, projects that mitigate against sea level rise. So in my district, uh, that's really important because it allows state and local transportation officials to plan and design and build differently. Uh, instead of highway widening projects from the 1970s, uh, it asks them, invites them to anticipate impacts we know are coming in the next 20 to 30 years. But it does require a change in approach, uh, some institutional changes to shift away from doing things the way they've always been done. And I just wanted to ask you about that. Is the Department of Transportation helping to guide or plan with local and state transportation officials to make sure that they are looking decades down the road and not building projects from the 70s. And I do realize that the chair asked you about uh, whether you're forcing states and locals to build certain ways. And I, I appreciate your answer that you are not. But are you offering uh, you know, guidance and help for them to plan in the way we need them to plan? Thank you for the question. And it's especially timely uh, given what we're seeing in terms of climate impacts on American infrastructure. And we know when we are uh, building something new that we might be making, uh, or the project sponsor might be making a 30, 40, 50 plus year decision, which means that we've got to be prepared uh, to build for the world as it will be, not the world as it has been. Uh, so for that reason, we are stepping up our efforts to uh, collaborate with different project sponsors on being able to uh, take those kinds of considerations that you raise into account. And I also want to, to stress our appreciation for the robust funding in the PROTECT program specifically dedicated uh, to enhancing resilience. Uh, that's $7.3 billion over five years uh, and uh, 1.4 of that uh, in, in this fiscal year. There's a for that's out of the formula program plus a discretionary program too uh, that we uh, look forward to rolling out soon. All of which we think will help to put our money where our mouth is as a country on the idea of building resilient infrastructure and preparing for all the impacts ahead. Appreciate you mentioning the PROTECT program um, and you said rolling out soon. Is there anything more you can tell us about the anticipated timeline for that? Uh, let's see, I brought my, my little table of upcoming uh, notices of funding opportunity because I knew this, this would be of interest. I don't have a hard date, uh, but I know that uh, it's one of the uh, priority programs we're looking forward to announcing uh, shortly, and uh, as soon as we do have a date, uh, we'll, uh, we'll make sure to make that known. We, we look forward to hearing about that. In, in the time I have left, Mr. Secretary, I want to ask you about EV charging infrastructure, another important element of the bipartisan infrastructure law. And there, there have been some recent reports of Tesla opening up its supercharger network to non-Tesla EVs. They're already 
doing this. I guess they've been required to do this in the European Union, uh, but um, I'm seeing some accounts of that change now coming here. Can you uh, talk about uh, you know whatever update you may have on that and how significant that would be to our aspiration of having ubiquitous, high quality EV charging infrastructure so we can accelerate this transition? Well, it would make a big difference. Uh, we are uh, working hard to reach the president's goal of half a million charging network, uh, charging uh, stations built out uh, in a nationwide network by the end of this decade. And uh, it's never been the vision that all of those are, uh, or uh, most of those, are government owned and operated. Uh, Tesla has built a, an extraordinary wide ranging uh, and highly effective network of, uh, of chargers that are available, of course, uh, for use uh, for the owners of those cars. Uh, I have heard uh, Tesla leadership, including in, in, uh, in meetings with, with me and other OEMs, uh, discuss uh, their vision for using uh, some kind of adapter equipment to make them uh, available to drivers of other vehicles. I haven't seen any uh, concrete uh, timelines or, or steps in that direction, but it's certainly something we would welcome. All right, thank you, I yield back. Next up is Mr. Jimenez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and uh, good to see you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Secretary, on September 6, 2019, in a campaign stop, the, the president in New Hampshire, he said, I want you to look into my eyes. I guarantee you we're going to end fossil fuel. Do you, do you, uh, do you support that? Well, I certainly support a transition to domestic clean energy in our lifetime. In your lifetime? Well, what, what's the time frame for that? For my lifetime? Uh, only God knows the answer to that question, sir. Okay. All right. What, what steps are you taking to you know, bring this along. What, what steps are you, do you want to see the demise of fossil fuels here in the United States? We want to see the rise of domestic clean energy production. It's creating a lot of jobs alongside fossil fuel industries, which of course are, uh, are still a very important part of our economy. We recognize that we're running out of time when it comes to the consequences in terms of the destruction of American property and lives uh, from the burning of fossil fuels in transportation applications and, uh, and, and uh, energy. We're pursuing a policy that's gonna create more domestic clean energy production uh, because we think that'll lead to a better economy and it'll save those lives and that property. Uh, even though the world, uh, there's estimates that the world is gonna need additional fossil fuels for the next 50, 60, 70 years, do you think that that should be American fossil fuels or that should be Saudi fossil fuel or Venezuelan fossil fuel? Our uh, preference, again, is American-made domestic clean energy production, and that's well, you what keep saying our clean energy. Uh, excuse me, you, seem, you, you keep saying clean energy. I'm talking about fossil fuel. I'm talking about natural gas. I'm yep. talking about gasoline, et cetera. Are you in favor of additional production here in the United States, or do you want to see that limited? Well, as you know, we've proposed, for example, that uh, oil companies that have decided not to produce right now uh, be faced with a choice. They can either produce on the permits that they have, uh, or they lose access to those. And that's an example of, uh, I think, the administration's recognition that, at least in the short term, uh, we are working with what we have, even as we're seeing a transition through. Uh, on, a sec on, a different, on a different tack, um, I looked at the, the F-150, you said, uh, both the electric and the, and the gas-powered one, and there's a difference of about $20,000 between mm -hmm. one and the other. Uh, and when you look at the $20,000, if you estimate about 20 miles a gallon, it's going to take about, at today's prices, it takes about 80,000 miles in order for you to break even. I'm not even talking about charging costs. I'm just talking, mm -hmm. you know, no charging costs. And so if you actually put that down to about $2.50 a gallon, which was, you know, the price of gas, you know, before the Biden administration, that you don't break even until about 160,000 miles. Is the Biden administration um, actively pursuing high energy prices in order to force Americans into electric vehicles? Of course not. And I also want to emphasize that the, uh, uh, you, you don't have to wait that 80,000 or 160,000 uh, uh, miles or however many it would be to break even if you don't pay for the vehicle in cash, right? The great thing about an auto loan is you can realize the save, or lease, is you can realize the savings in terms of uh, less maintenance and less fuel, uh, even while the initial car payment might be higher, right? And so uh, you're coming out ahead right out of the gate instead of having to wait many years for a payback, unless, of course, you are buying the vehicle in cash. No, you can, you can I mean, your finance costs are gonna be, depends if you, if you, uh, if you lease it, et cetera, but the finance, sure. at the end of the day, you're gonna be paying $20,000 more, however you cut it, at least. And that, actually, if you finance it, you're gonna pay more because you're gonna be paying interest, all right? So at the end of the day, again, 
you're going to take e either 80 at $5 a gallon, it's 80,000 miles to break even. And then, by the way, have you figured in the 10-year lifespan of a battery that you have to change? So if you have 100... Yes, we have. I mean, the, okay. the estimates that are showing that this is reaching parity and pointing toward a savings, depending on the model, do account for things like that. But but you would agree that the higher the, ga the price of gas, then the, the faster you reach that parity. Of course, the more pain we are all experiencing from the high price, price of gas, the more benefit there is for those who can access electric vehicles. It's why we're hoping you and your colleagues might reconsider opposing the reduction of EV upfront prices with tax credits. So, so you're, you're saying the more pain we have, the more benefit we're going to get. Of course. Now, I no. think that's what I heard you say. Now, you said the more pain that we <laughs> really, have. That's, that's what you heard no, me say. That's what I heard you say. I know you the want me to say it have. so bad, but, but okay. uh, honestly, sir, what we're saying is that we could have no pain at all by making EVs cheaper for everybody, and we'd love to have your support on that. Uh, EVs cheaper by subsidizing them? Or yes, that's part of it. Yeah, but that makes, doesn't make it cheaper. I mean, well, actually, it does. So you have a, you have a market all making in the end. We're well, all right, but taxes. It, okay. But it makes it cheaper because that market making investment gets you past the tipping point. Current estimates actually are that the U.S. as we cross that five percent new sales level is starting to hit what analysts typically consider to be that tipping point. But the more we stimulate the production of the clean cars, right? The more you hit the economies of scale, that makes them cheaper to produce in the first place, which means that you won't need as many subsidies in the future. That, that's why we believe in this policy. Well, that's subject debate. Thank you very much. My time's up. I yield back. Thank you. Congressman Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, Secretary, thank you for being here today. It's always good to see you. Uh, a couple notes. Um, uh, the um, funding you mentioned going to um, Long, Long Beach in reference to the rail, the rail expansion along the um, ships to remove the, the need for trucks. Um, we might want to look at that for um, Port Newark <clears throat> as well. And so um, just, you know, I'm always throwing things at you, by the way. Um, and um, also, um, in February, I led, a, led 34 other members uh, in asking DOT to get nearly $7 billion out the door quickly to advance investments in the Northeast Corridor, the dreaded Northeast Corridor. Ooh. Uh, under the department's current timeline for establishing the uh, Northeast Corridor inventory, states and others are not likely to see uh, this money until 2023. Um, FRA's delay is unacceptable. What is your department doing to expedite the availability uh, of these funds to answer our demand? for a better passenger rail. So we recognize the importance of working swiftly to, to prepare these investments, uh, while also making sure that these uh, investments that you only get to do once are, are uh, well considered. Uh, the Northeast Corridor Commission is uh, uh, working through uh, the, um, uh, the, the next steps, and we've been consulting with them. Uh, on June 25th, the FRA published a notice of approach to develop the NEC project inventory and opened up a, a comment period to get input from the uh, stakeholders uh, on the commission. And we want to continue that consultation with the commission, but uh, that, that process is one, again, that, that happens not without a sense of urgency. And so we remain on track to publish the inventory by the statutory deadline, which is uh, November 15th of this year. Thank you. Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, on my... Um taking over the chairmanship of uh, railroads, pipelines, has material, um, found at the FRA uh, that um, there was no DBE program and the Federal Railroad Administration has, uh, has studying if discrimination exists uh, in the passenger rail industry, I can answer that, which uh, would suggest the need uh, for a disadvantaged business enterprise program. It's critical that this study is completed both thoroughly and promptly so that if a need is uh, shown for the uh, FRA DBE program, Congress can respond quickly to guarantee that the IIJA rail funding creates a fair playing field for disadvantaged businesses. When do you expect um, the disparity study to be completed? Uh, and do I have a commitment um, that this remains 
as you told us last year, it's a top priority for you. Yes, it is very important to us to deliver uh, on this priority, and uh, we've undertaken a number of actions to move hope forward uh, with this program and provide uh, uh, Congress with a, a package of material for consideration. I can tell you that the team is, is, is working hard to complete the study. It's a, a top topic every time I uh, sit down with our uh, FRA administrator, uh, and uh, as soon as it is uh, uh, fit for delivery, we will have it in your hands. Thank you. Uh uh, well, I think that's all I have, um, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Next up will be Mr. Mast. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Payne, you could have yielded me your time. I would have. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today. Um, I want to ask a, a very specific question, and this is about hours of service for truckers. Um, do you feel as though that, that you are endangering the lives of any American on the roadway uh, with the hours of service waivers that are being given for truckers that are hauling something related to COVID or, you know, Clorox or automobile parts? Or well, we think the waivers are justified or we wouldn't enact them. I do think that over time we're going to learn from the data that come back on what effect, uh, looking back on these years, the, the waivers will have determined to have. But, uh, of course, uh, if we didn't believe that they were a responsible way to strike the balance, we, we wouldn't pursue them. Uh, agreed with you, Secretary. If we didn't believe that they were responsible, they, they wouldn't be in place. So there are hours of service waiver uh, for allowing truckers who carry food, fuel, products to fight COVID, livestock, car parts, uh, a, a host of things on that list. Uh, and they can basically set their own flexible driving schedule that they otherwise wouldn't be allowed to as long as they take uh, a 10-hour break each day. So it's far more simple than what they otherwise fall under without that waiver. So I, I would say it in this way. I think you, can, I, you and I could agree that a trucker is not a, a safer driver because they're carrying frosted flakes that might be on the waiver list versus laundry detergent. That would be an agreeable statement? I think so. We, obviously, we, we recognize there are certain differences uh, in, in cargo, but uh, not all of those differences are the same as the ones that qualify you for the waiver. If, if that's but in that example, Frosted Flakes would be wavered so that you could just, you know, have a 10-hour break. Laundry detergent wouldn't be wavered. Okay. So that wouldn't make a difference in the quality of the, the trucker or how they perform their duties or safety? I hope not. I, I would hope not as well. Likewise, we couldn't say that they would be better because they're carrying Clorox wipes versus baby clothes, right? And the list could go on and on. So the request here is, you know, for our truckers, the administration, it's clearly determined that this kind of flexibility for truckers, it's not a major safety threat to say truckers, hey, if you're carrying COVID-related uh, COVID items or Clorox wipes, all you need to do is make sure that you have a 10-hour break. We don't need all of these other things that go on in that, in that hours of service, uh, you know, lack of flexibility. So it's not a threat. We agree on that. We've determined it. The, the goods being carried don't determine the threat largely. Obviously, there can be hazardous materials. But even when we talk about hazardous materials, we could say that fuel is on that waiver list, probably one of the most hazardous materials that could potentially be involved in a collision, but that is on the waiver list. So we look at this and we say the Trump administration, they had that policy for about nine months. The Biden administration has now had that waiver policy for about a year and a half. So the request is let's make it permanent and extend uh, those protocols to truckers that are carrying anything, right? They shouldn't have to go through the red tape of determining whether they're carrying frosted flakes or laundry detergent or Clorox wipes or baby clothes or whatever, if it's not a safety threat, as we've determined it's not, to, to give them those 10 hours, yep. uh, you get 10 hours of rest, it's not a safety threat. Let's let them not have to waiver this. So I think the response to that hangs on the difference between believing something is a responsible balance and believing it has no safety impact at all. I think we're agreed that it was a responsible way to strike the balance, especially in responding to a crisis that's claimed the lives of a million Americans. I would want to see more data suggesting that there was no safety impact at all before I could endorse the, the, the conclusion that, that, that you're uh, speaking to. But I do think, you know, it, it, it is reasonable to say that any time, uh, even if it arises out of an emergency, 
uh, we gather data from some kind of flexibility being introduced, we should learn from that and include that in our decision making for the future. I just wouldn't say that we've reached the point where we think that in any way justifies uh, releasing those safety requirements wholesale. Yeah, and, and I can appreciate you wanting to look at the finer data points of this. Uh, it would be wrong for us not to do that, but again, just to, to close that, we can see that we are assessing there's not a big enough safety threat to, to get rid of it. It's gone on for nine months under Trump and a year and a half uh, you know, plus two years under Biden, so it's not a big enough safety threat to not do that. We should be looking at that for everybody given you know, people carry a host of different things. Just one final quick point here, uh, and this comes from uh, people that have to deal with the FAA badge office. Uh, I have an understanding that there are uh, a number of very disrespectful people in the FAA badge office uh, that people in DC here are not happy having to deal with in that office. If you could address that in the way that they treat people that come through that badge office, uh, it would be greatly appreciated by some people that I I'll know. I'll look into that right away. Thanks Thank for you very much. Appreciate it. Chair recognizes Mr. Lowenthal for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, I represent the Port of Long Beach. I'm the co-chair with Randy Weber from Texas of the Congressional Cau uh, Caucus on Ports. Thank you for being here and thank you for visiting our ports and really becoming so knowledgeable about our ports. I, and I appreciate your efforts uh, to ease port congestion and to reduce the cost for all American consumers. The uh, IIJA Port Infrastructure Development Program or the PIDP is among the most critical tools to make freight move more efficiently, to strengthen our supply chains and tackling the uh, shipping costs. In addition to the, to the to the legislation, measures like expanding gate hours at ports, pop-up container storage sites, ensuring more transparency and data for freight exchanges have been so, so important. Uh, and there's important signs of progress. For example, freight rates from China to the West Coast have fallen almost 50% in the last two months. I want to stress how critical it is that we ensure that the PIDP is allocated as quickly as possible and that these funds support the electrification projects needed to increase efficiency and to reduce the environmental impacts which uh, our higher freight flows have had on our climate and on our frontline communities. We also need to prioritize the funding available under section 11402 of the IIJA to reduce um, truck idling at ports. Mr. Secretary, can you share more about what the administration is doing to prioritize these critical projects, to coordinate multimodal freight flows and to reduce costs? And when can we expect funding to be awarded? Thank you very much for the question and, and for the attention to the importance of efficiently and smoothly moving uh, freight through our ports. As you mentioned, we've seen a lot of gains in terms of uh, sharp reductions in the number of ships at anchor uh, and in terms of improvements in shipping rates, uh, although they are still, uh, of course, higher than their pre-COVID levels and we know there's uh, more work to be done here. Uh, specifically with regard to the Port Infrastructure Development Program, we're working to uh, advance the uh, 2022 funding as quickly as we can. Uh, we released the uh, notice funding opportunity for that program within 90 days of, of the infrastructure law passing, consistent with the President's call to move quickly as part of the Port's Action Plan. Uh, and uh, uh, we've also issued the amendment uh, incorporating the funding from the Appropriations Act within 60 days of that legislation moving uh, through. So uh, now we've got the applications in, working diligently to review them and anticipate being able to announce awards early in the fall and uh, really look forward to the difference that that, that can make in terms of our uh, capacity and readiness at our ports. In the meantime, of course, we're not waiting for longer term infrastructure upgrades in order to continue trying to drive progress in this regard. And I would point to uh, measures like the uh, creation of flow, freight logistics optimization works, 
this is a data sharing uh, platform. It's not mandatory. We we're not uh, ordering anybody to share anything. It's voluntary, but those different players, including uh, private sector actors in different parts of the supply chain who contribute data, then get access to the benefits of participating in that system. We think it's going to make a, a big difference, and we're looking forward to having a prototype of that up later on this year. Uh, and our ports envoy, uh, General Stephen Lyons, continues to work with uh, all of the different players at the ports to spot and identify any and all issues that, that can be addressed in the near term, whether it's through federal action uh, within our authorities or just getting the right players at the table. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, and I yield back. Thank you. The chair recognizes uh, Representative Johnson for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Secretary, first off, I would thank you for the, comment, uh, the positive comments you've made about the Ocean Shipping Reform Act uh, that uh, Mr. Garamendi and I helped to usher through the House. And uh, so thank you for your support of that. I, we've talked a lot about ports so far today, and I think that'll help. It's not a silver bullet, but I think it'll help. When you appeared before this committee last year, you and I had a productive conversation about siting and about how the same type of project that would take two years to get cited in highway project uh, in France or in Germany, on average would take seven and a half years in America, which is clearly uh, not, uh, not evidence of American exceptionalism, and in fact uh, makes it harder to, to have American exceptionalism present itself. You had talked then about some of the things that we can do. I think you said to move aspiration into action are we making any progress on that front? And do you see room for additional leadership uh, by this Congress in helping make it easier for us to do large projects? Well, first of all, let me acknowledge and thank you for your work on the, the Bipartisan Ocean Shipping Reform Act. It's another thing I should have mentioned just now in my uh, uh, earlier answer of uh, something that we think will make progress on uh, when it comes to uh, uh, shipping and, and supply chains. Uh, and to your question, uh, yes, I think we've, we've made progress, and, and yes, I agree, there's, uh, there's much more work to be done. The comparisons to Europe are especially uh, important, I think, because uh, we're talking about countries that uh, are certainly rigorous in their labor standards and in their environmental standards, and yet consistently seem to be able to deliver projects at a lower cost and uh, at a swifter timeline than tends to happen in the U.S. Uh, some of the things we've done in this regard include uh, increasing our visibility on what's going on with permitting. So the permitting dashboard is our main tool for doing that. Um, and enacting the one federal decision related provisions that were in the Infrastructure uh, Investment and Jobs Act uh, that's included uh, matching up the categorical exclusions that our department can, uh, uh, can join to with other uh, agencies when there's some interagency question. Uh, and uh, uh, making sure that we have a game plan for how to hit those averages called for, the two-year average, uh, for the kinds of environmental review that, uh, that many of our projects are, are subject to. Uh, but we recognize this is, uh, this is uh, going to be a big ship to turn and welcome uh, all opportunities for good faith collaboration on how to do it without, of course, diminishing uh, community voices uh, or environmental or, or, or other important uh, labor, other important um, policy considerations, but having a, a, uh, a pace and a cost of getting through these processes that I think is what most Americans would expect. Yeah, and one of the things I struggle with is, and, and this is true whether we're talking high voltage transmission lines or highways, people will talk about how long it takes to get something cited, and then I will tell them, okay, bring me the specific knob we can turn, right? And, and I'm sure you ask the same question. Because there are so many factors that slow down these processes, it can be hard to figure out what button do you push or what lever do you pull. So it's a bit of an unfair question uh, for me to ask you, but as you review all of these myriad things that make it difficult to get big projects done in this country, is, is there one piece that we should focus our collective fire on? One or two specific things we could be working together? I think... As you noted, there's, there's not a silver bullet here, but I do think there, there are a few directions that will be productive to look in. Uh, one is the, the capacity of the project sponsor, so making sure that, that 
they have the tools they need to navigate these processes, especially because if we're successful in bringing investments to jurisdictions that haven't had much before, maybe small rural jurisdictions or, and or low-income areas that just haven't done much with the federal process, we can't expect them on day one to know how, how to navigate it. So I think the, the support and the technical assistance there is, is going to be important. Uh, second, of course, is to make the processes simpler in the first place. It's one of the reasons you see us combining some of our notices of funding opportunity and even combining the selection process, just to have less paper and fewer steps involved uh, by virtue of having fewer programs on, on parallel tracks. Uh, I think visibility matters. That's why we think that uh, uh, the dashboard, I know it's a, a, a readout, not a mandate, but, uh, but I actually think it could play an important role because it'll just help us spot uh, some of these, these issues. Uh, we're trying to uh, make sure we are uh, combining the final EIS and the record of decision uh, to, to make sure that uh, there's not a big gap between those. Uh, we've also uh, uh, pursued the uh, integration of the, some of the permitting processes with the NEPA side of it uh, because we think some of those things can travel together too. So I'm afraid I, I don't have a, a sense of one or two things that would make uh, all the difference, but uh, anything and everything that we can do consistent with our bedrock uh, commitments, we're, we're certainly open to exploring. Mr. Secretary, thanks. And then, Mr. Chairman, by way of closing, I would just note that this is a serious problem. I mean, nobody would suggest that European countries flout environmental or labor standards. They are able to get it done in two years. Uh, frankly, America should be able to get these projects done in that kind of time frame as well. And I thank uh, the Secretary for his efforts. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Mr. Lynch for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Mr. Secretary. Good to see you. Uh, Steve Lynch, I represent the Port of Boston, and thank you for your, your recent visit. It sounds like you've been getting around to all of our ports. That's a good thing. Uh, I want to be, I want to, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, the support of the Biden administration and, and your office. Uh, recently, we received $62 million to try to uh, rebuild the terminals in uh, Logan Airport. Uh, those are 1974 era terminals, so we really appreciate the uh, opportunity to update those. I want to also thank your office for uh, working with us on the North Jetty. Uh, we have obviously one of the oldest ports in the country, and uh, some of our uh, infrastructure dates back to you know pre World War One. So uh, we're trying to repair that, and your office has been very very helpful. In addition, uh, we've had some problems with the MBTA recently and uh, the uh, Federal Transit uh, Administration has been very, very helpful in terms of coming in with guidelines that allow us to operate that system, uh, not at full capacity, but safely. And, and we appreciate their thoughtful and deliberate approach to that. Uh, one of the other positions I hold is, is I'm, I'm a vice chair of the Quiet Skies Caucus. And so we're having, uh, we're having difficulty. Uh, in and around Logan Airport. Logan Airport was actually originally built in the 1920s by the United States Army. And they laid out the runways uh, to favor the wind direction for those planes back in the 1920s that didn't have much thrust. So uh, unfortunately, as the city has grown, uh, those runways now steer planes directly over uh, many environmental justice communities. And uh, not only that, but uh, with the advent of uh, next-gen RNAV systems, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of planes flying over laser-guided air vectors over the same homes mm -hmm. repeatedly, uh, and it's, uh, it's causing health problems for the people in those areas next to the airport. Now, I have tried to persuade the FAA to look at uh, an approach here where they would they would adjust the configuration of the runways. We have an entire port area where they could be bringing in flights and having flights take off completely over water, not flying over these densely settled, uh, as I say, env environmental justice neighborhoods. Uh, but I have had great difficulty in persuading them to do so. I'm, I'm wondering if your, your administration, your office, would be willing to work with us on that. Uh, you know, we. We obviously have a great need in the area, uh, but this is, this, is, this is critical to the uh, quality of life to the people in my district. Well, I want to recognize your, your leadership uh, of, of the Quiet Skies Caucus, and, uh, and certainly we recognize that as 
the FAA moves to modernize the national airspace system, there is a, a risk that the, uh, these efforts can result in changes to the flight pattern that, that effectively concentrate the, the, the route and concentrate the noise. And this, of course, concentrates the impact on the residents who live directly under them. Uh, I, uh, uh, I'd be humbled by, by um, uh, attempting to, to venture anything specific to runway configuration uh, here. I, I know that's very technical, often has to do with things like the direction of the wind uh, and other uh, engineering considerations, but uh, certainly uh, would welcome further dialogue with your office on how to make sure that those community impacts are managed as, um, uh, as responsively as, as possible and that any mitigations that can be identified responsibly are pursued. I know that uh, uh, the FAA has uh, uh, sought to add uh, resources in terms of community engagement, uh, and anytime that's found wanting, welcome the, the chance to work with the Congressional Office to try to uh, firm, firm that dialogue up. That's great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I just want to point out that uh, periodically we do have to redo the the, uh, the runways. We just had uh, we just had one of the one of the major runways redone uh, several well over a year ago now. Uh, and we shut it down and we moved the flights to another another runway. So logistically, we could do this if, if we had, the, uh, you know, I've had uh, dealings with the FAA and in some things they're great and on other things they're, they're uh, um, impervious to, to public input and impervious to congressional uh, persuasion as well. So I'd appreciate your uh, cooperation on that and, and uh, I'm thankful for the work that you've done in the Port of Boston, and I appreciate what the Biden administration has done as well. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Balderson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Secretary. Thank you for being here. I was actually on the same flight to Columbus on Friday night with you, so it's good to see you. Uh, going through the airport and getting on the plane, so right. thank you. Uh, I was a strong supporter of the Dry Safe Act, and I was proud to offer this bill as an amendment when the committee marked up Chairman DeFazio's infrastructure bill last year. This program creates a pathway for CDL holders between the ages of 18 to 20 to participate in interstate commerce after completing substantial safety training. And while I had major concerns with the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, I was happy to see this important pilot program included in the final bill. Can you discuss the current status of the DRAFES, excuse me, the DRAFES driver apprentice pilot program? Well, we, we uh, I want to recognize your work on this and, and uh, recognize also that it happens in the broader context of needing to make sure that we, we have the strongest and best possible workforce in truck driving. Uh, it has been estimated that uh, the, the gap is as high as 80,000, although I think it's closed to some extent. And so the, the question uh, that, that this pilot program speaks to, of course, is uh, is there a way to engage younger drivers without any kind of detriment to, to safety? And I think the uh, pilot program has provided us with a responsible way to, to determine that. Uh, in January of this year, FMCSA uh, announced the establishment of the program in the Federal Register. So that was the, uh, the first step, really, to, to get the details out about the pilot. And they're now completing some of the other administrative tasks they'll need just because it's, it's a new program. Uh, but I do believe we will be able to begin to accept applications into this program by the end of summer of this year. And then we'll be watching closely, of course, to, uh, to see how it unfolds and to ultimately gather the data that will tell us what, if any, safety impact there is. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that answer. Um, Mr. Secretary, last month I uh, sent you a bipartisan letter signed by 67 of my colleagues regarding several issues facing motor fuel carriers and those transporting hazardous materials. One of these issues is the costly background check redundancies within the Transportation Worker Identification Credential Hazardous Waste Endorsement and the TSA pre-check programs. I've heard from drivers across industries that streamlining or harmonizing these credentials, which largely require the same information, would go a long way in reducing costs and unnecessary burdens on drivers. I understand this issue is under TSA's jurisdiction, but since you're the co-chair of the Supply Chain Disruption Tax Force and you're the primary regulator of the trucking industry as Secretary of Transportation, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on this matter or if you've heard anything from TSA or DHS on efforts to, redu to reduce these redundancies. 
Well, I don't want to preempt the process of replying to your letter just because we do want to make sure we coordinate with DHS on that given TSA's role. But, but let me affirm the, the general principle that whenever the government's gathering information from the same person twice, we have an opportunity. And uh, provided we can find ways to, to uh, meet this concern that don't have any adverse effect on, on safety and security, we're very open to examining what we can do. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and any time you're in Columbus, Ohio, again, let me know. I'll get a nice dinner arrangement for you. So thank you, sir. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Representative Carvajal for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Secretary Buttigieg, uh, welcome. Uh, I commend you and the uh, Biden administration for your leadership in helping us to advance the historic bipartisan infrastructure law. This represents some of the largest investments to bring our nation's roads, bridges, transit, broadband, and waterways into the 21st century, and at the same time, create good paying jobs for many Americans. My district has already begun to benefit from these federal infrastructure dollars in so many ways. Currently, the Santa Barbara County Association of Governments is working towards improving the US Highway 101 which is one of two critical and major north-south arteries in California. This May, they apply for federal mega infra dollars to reduce congestion along the portion of the US 101, encourage a shift from, of mode of transportation, strengthen job accessibility, and reduce harmful pollution from greenhouse gas emissions. I worked on this project when I served in local government on the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors. And I can tell you, this project is a win, win, win. Not only for our local region, but for the entire state transportation system. There is $810 million, almost a billion dollars, in state and local funds, yes, I said local funds, currently pledged to this project, which means approximately 80% of this project is coming from non-federal sources. So I think it's fair to say that it's time for the federal government to step up. Can you provide an update on the time frame for when your department will be making determinations on these applications? Well, thank you for the question. And uh, certainly we recognize that, that uh, and the former mayor in me recognizes that, that state and local jurisdictions have been asked to shoulder too much for too long. It's, it's part of why the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is, is so welcome. And part of what we've sought to do with the particular program you're referencing, the, the combined uh, infra mega uh, rural NOFO, is to position ourselves to deploy these dollars uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, when the deadline closed for this combined notice of funding opportunity, we had uh, uh, more than 450 applications. So we're working through those right now uh, and uh, should be able to announce selections in the fall. And looking forward to funding as, as many deserving applications as we can, and, uh, uh, and this will certainly get full and fair consideration. Great. Thank you. Again, 80% funded with non-federal dollars. As a member of the Climate Solutions Caucus, I supported the inclusion of the Carbon Reduction Program in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. How are you working uh, towards reducing harmful carbon emissions? Well, the carbon reduction program is going to give us $6.4 billion in resources to help communities and, and states and jurisdictions in this work. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing the plans as they uh, begin coming through on how states uh, aim to use that. I should emphasize uh, the bulk of this is, uh, is formula dollars that, uh, that the states can program as they see fit, provided it's, it's consistent with uh, uh, the, the basic outlines of, of what Congress uh, calls for in, in the legislation. Of course, that's not all there is to, to uh, the opportunity to mitigate carbon through this infrastructure law. Uh, just about anything you do in transit, almost by definition, will lead to reduced carbon pollution. Uh, that's doubly true for things like the low and no uh, bus, uh, low and no emission bus program, and other things that help transit, uh, which is already uh, presumptively uh, uh, carbon uh, reducing, to uh, to also operate on a cleaner basis. Uh, and I think uh, across all of the programming you see, uh, even or especially when we're meeting other goals, like uh, enhancing our supply chains or giving uh, commuters or passengers a more convenient and, and uh, uh, an efficient experience, uh, that we're going to be making a major difference on carbon as well. Thank you. Let me just close by uh, reiterating my standing invitation to you to visit my district. Uh, as you can see, that 101 major project is a very significant 
effort going on in my region, but there's many others, and I hope you'll consider coming out. Uh, I know my constituents would love to showcase all that we've done and continue to do in regards to transportation and infrastructure. So please come out. Some of us call my area paradise on earth, which uh, you would be remiss uh, to not come out to. Thank you. I'd love it. Thank you. He does have a very nice district, I can as chair attest to that. Um, we'll now recognize Mr. Katko for five minutes. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, mean, I just want to correct the record and say that Syracuse, New York is paradise on earth, not, not Mr. Salud's district. But uh, Mr. Buttigieg, uh, I want to thank you very much for being here today. And it's good to see you again. The last time I saw you, uh, I think we were in the White House a year ago in the Oval Office in February, speaking about infrastructure with a small group of individuals with the president and vice president there as well. And uh, lots happened since then. And I'm thrilled to say that I was the very first Republican to cast my vote in favor of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, it's a culmination of many years of work on my part and others. And uh, it started back in 2017 with the Problem Solvers Caucus. I chaired the subcommittee that issued an infrastructure report. We updated it in 21. We presented it to a, a group of governors, senators, members of Congress, and it caught fire and went from there. So I'm thrilled that we finally got it across the finish line. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be able to talk to you about it here today. And Central New York, as you know, is going to be a major beneficiary of this act because of the Interstate 81 rebuild that's going to be going through the heart of the city. And that money is sorely needed there and elsewhere across this country. Providing stable and dependable federal funding for infrastructure was one of the reasons I came to Congress. And I was proud to do my part to make that a reality by supporting this, this, this infrastructure bill. In addition to providing billions of dollars for a wide range of other physical infrastructure priorities, New York State is seeing a significant increase in its apportionment of federal highway aid under this law, which is welcome news. From major highway projects to addressing wear and tear on rural roads, this funding makes a huge difference top to bottom across our state. And unfortunately, along with many of my con constituents, I'm concerned about how far this money is going to go in the near future due to the dramatic rise in inflation. I want to note that the infrastructure bill is not the problem here. And it, 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 it's not the inflation driver. In fact, there's not an expert who says it is. In fact, according to experts from the American Enterprise Institute, the infrastructure bill actually eases inflationary pressures in the long run because of its focus on improving productivity over the next decade. However, as we all know, this was not the only bill Congress passed last year. And we now find ourselves at a point where inflation reached a 40-year high of 9.1% last month, which is the most I've seen since I was a young man in the Carter administration, when the Carter administration was in power. Inflation has impacted prices in every sector, but of specific interest to our conversation today is the prices of construction materials and fuel, which are both through the roof. As states and localities try to budget for in-demand road and bridge projects, sustained inflation is going to make it even more difficult to stretch these critical infrastructure dollars to cover the projects that Congress intends them to. As a result, we end up facing the exact same dependability challenges this bill was supposed to address. So I have a couple of quick questions for you. Uh, and, and if you could help me with them, I'd appreciate it. Um, first of all, what steps are the department uh, taking to ensure that pur the purchasing power of the Infrastructure Act uh, is, uh, is remains intact? And, and second of all, you can take in these in either order you like. Um, can I assume that the Department of Transportation is focusing their efforts on permitting reforms to the Infrastructure Act to help reduce abate in costs and delays for these projects. And with that, I yield back. Well, uh, uh, thank you, and, and let me recognize uh, uh, your support and leadership when it came to uh, this infrastructure law coming together and, and strongly agree with you and, and with the economists who have indicated that uh, uh, seeing it through is going to ease inflationary pressure. Uh, for that reason, we feel a great sense of urgency about making sure that we uh, effectively uh, use these, these taxpayer dollars. And there's no question that the increased cost of input to building infrastructure uh, represents a, a challenge for us in implementation. Uh, this is true whether we're talking about supply chain constraints contributing to, uh, uh, to raw material costs or whether we're talking about uh, workforce shortages impacting labor costs. Uh, so several things that we are able to do, and uh, uh, one thing I would point to is the collaboration that we have with project sponsors uh, to share best practices from what we've seen around the country and even around the world on how to effectively keep those costs under control, uh, use technical assistance to, to provide that kind of support. 
uh, and of course continue working the, the root causes of the issue through efforts like the uh, Supply Chain Disruptions Task Force. We also see certain flexibilities that do exist within the legislative framework, and, and when they are there, we will pursue them in order to make sure project sponsors succeed, uh, but are, are, of course, always open to working with Congress on other measures that we can take uh, to make sure that uh, we really get that value, that $1.2 trillion worth of economic and, uh, and other benefit to the American people uh, for the taxpayer investment that's being made here. Good. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you so much. I'll recognize myself now. Um, let me start, Mr. Secretary, setting a couple of, a couple of things straight. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree with me that every American should have the freedom to buy whatever kind of car they want. Agreed. But when more people buy EVs, the, the overall demand for gas goes down, right? Which means that the price of gas also goes down for everybody who still exercises their choice to buy a gas guzzling car. So this is a win-win. I, I don't understand why this has become a partisan or tribal issue in America. Um, and then when it comes to gas prices and, and Putin, um, I, I remember the days immediately after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, virtually all of my Republican colleagues were taking to the airwaves demanding that President Biden ban Russian oil. Um, every single speech on the House floor and committee hearings confronting administration officials coming to brief us, and all of us knew perfectly well that this would result in gas prices going up. You cannot take the number two world's exporter of oil offline in a day without having that effect. And I, in, that, in those days, I, I, I drafted a, a House resolution that would have urged President Biden to do exactly that, to ban Russian oil, but in the text, acknowledging that there would be economic sacrifices for the American people hoping that we could come together as Democrats and Republicans patriotically urging the president to do the right thing, but taking common responsibility. And I couldn't find a single Republican to sign on to that resolution because apparently some people wanted the president to do it and then to blame him for the consequences. And unfortunately, we're still seeing that today. With that, um, I want to ask you what I, about what I always ask you about, which is the, the gateway program for um, New Jersey and New York. We've made such extraordinary progress working with you and your team. We ended the Trump era policy that made it harder for states to finance their portion of big infrastructure projects. We finally got the environmental impact statement done for, uh, for the tunnel. We secured an improved project rating from the Federal Transit Administration. We signed a full funding grant agreement to replace the Portal North Bridge, uh, and we'll be breaking ground on that essential project in the coming days. And just two weeks ago, New Jersey and New York agreed uh, on how they're going to split the costs of this incredibly important project at the state level. And then, of course, we passed the infrastructure bill that will, that will fund this. But just as I pushed really hard to get us to this point, I'm going to push just as hard to get this done faster. And I understand these projects are complicated. They don't get built overnight, but I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear my constituents are not going to be happy uh, to hear uh, statements like this could wait, this could go until 2035. It's not going to be acceptable. So I actually want to echo Mr. Johnson's uh, question to you about why infrastructure project delivery in the United States takes so long and costs so much in comparison with other wealthy countries that have equally strong labor and environmental standards as the United States, what are we going to do about it, and how can we apply those measures to this project, the Gateway Project for New Jersey and New York? Thank you. Well, thank you. First of all, let me uh, share your enthusiasm for making sure that the Gateway Project is a success. It, it holds the potential to ease congestion, to provide better service, to uh, create uh, stronger uh, redundancy and availability for intercity rail and, and a whole number of other issues that will uh, be very important for the Northeast Corridor and, and represents such an economically significant set of transportation activities that the entire country will, will, will benefit. And in particular, I want to uh, uh, applaud the uh, agreement that was reached between New York and, and New Jersey, knowing that it's never a, a small or easy thing to, uh, uh, for two states to agree on cost sharing. And I, I called Governor uh, Murphy and Governor Hochul to express my appreciation for their leadership on that. Um, it is a, 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 a project or a set of projects that will, 
I think, test us in terms of our ability to reduce the, the gap between the cost it takes to deliver a project in the U.S. and the cost you see in a lot of other Western countries. While I can't point to any single factor that explains the difference, there are a number of things that we know contribute to it. Uh, part of it is the complexity of aligning the different parties, and so that's why we're so pleased to see the states collaborating in this regard. Uh, also, the Gateway Development uh, Commission now has its executive director named. Uh, that's also, we think, a very positive development because it gives you the unified leadership that you need. Uh, we also want to inventory best, practice from, best practices from other countries or other parts of the U.S. that have uh, been quicker than others while maintaining project quality. And we are driving ourselves very hard internally to try to make sure the process is as smooth and as straightforward as possible. Uh, we think that uh, with the right level of intentionality, we can buck the trend of very large, very complex projects to go longer and cost more than they should. Thank you so much. Uh, I yield back my time uh, and we'll now go to Mr. Westerman for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Secretary Buttigieg, for being here today. Uh, I'm count me among one of those members of Congress who didn't vote for the, uh, what I would call the world's largest infrastructure spending package in the history of the world, uh, one that was more than enough money to completely rebuild the U.S. interstate highway system in today's dollars. Um, but the big issue was that never even, not only did it not come before this committee, it went before no committee and had no markup in the, uh, in the House of Representatives. But it is the law now, and uh, as we look to do oversight on it, I noticed that uh, last Friday, um, FHWA proposed a notice of proposed rulemaking to require state DOTs and metropolitan planning organizations to establish declining do carbon dioxide targets and develop a system for measuring and reporting greenhouse gas emissions. This is uh, kind of in line with the president's executive order in January of 2021. However, nobody voted on this in the uh, IJA because it, it wasn't in there. So in light of the Supreme Court's recent ruling on the EPA's authority over power plant emissions, uh, do you have any concerns that the administration may be overstepping the, the law and putting this out? And plus, the amount of time, it's, this is a big issue, and uh, I've already had my state DOT contact me about uh, you know, not having enough time to comment on it. Uh, we're very confident in the congressional authority for, uh, for this rule. It actually dates back to 2012 when uh, Congress passed MAP 21, which provides for the Federal Highway Administration to put out performance measures. Uh, we've used that authority, or I should say the department, because much of it's before my time. Uh, but the department has successfully used that authority on a number of, of different issues. And this is part of that tradition. And, and I think one that comes at a very important time. Uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, the, the clear, uh, obviously, the evidence on climate change and the destruction of American lives and property uh, due to climate change is beyond any doubt. We also know that the largest sector in the U.S. economy contributing greenhouse emissions is the transportation sector. And we've been very mindful of the limits on federal authority in crafting this uh, proposed rulemaking. It doesn't, uh, uh, for example, mandate any targets. It's really about the states uh, being able to uh, track their progress toward their own targets. Uh, but with this being such a central issue of importance for, for the world and for the American people, uh, what would it say about us if we couldn't even measure it? And so we're trying to get those basic standards in place. And if your state DOT has any concerns in, in terms of their ability to comply, uh, this is certainly the time to make those known through the NPRM comment process, but also we'd be happy to engage with them directly. Thank you. And you, know, you talked about uh, climate and carbon. It's something that um, I work on. I'll work on a lot of natural climate solutions, but um, you had mentioned earlier in the testimony, I know you have a goal, or you're bought into the goal of, I think, replacing half of the fleet by 2030 or half of the new car sales, and you just mentioned that transportation is the largest sector of climate emission, or carbon emissions, so what percent of the world's carbon emissions is, is the United States accountable for? I think at this point, we, are, we remain in the top two, if I recall correctly, and are in the neighborhood of 15%. 15%, and that transportation being the largest part of that, what percentage of that 15% is trans Depending how you count, something like a third. Okay, a third of 15%. Of I think the number is actually closer to 27%, but that's all of transportation. How much of the transportation uh, are passenger cars responsible for? 
I would say surface is the biggest share. I don't have the percentage uh, offhand. I just know that it's something we're responsible for, and with every piece that we're responsible for, shame on us if we don't do the best that we can. Yeah, and if, if you go through the math, uh, you find out that if every electron going into an electric vehicle, if all uh, passenger cars were electric vehicles, you're offsetting less than 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions, which that's nothing to laugh at, but it's just not the panacea that I see folks on the left claiming uh, that it is, and it's a huge cost uh, to our country. Do you think there's other areas maybe we should, with all the challenges with electric vehicles, and I heard you talking earlier about how we're developing the minerals and elements, the copper wire, the lithium. Well, you're saying that, and then I'm, I'm the ranking member on the Natural Resources Committee, and I see bill after bill to withdraw mining uh, from federal lands where these resources lie. So if we're developing them here in this country, I sure don't know where we're developing them. It appears to me that we're relying more heavily on China and other countries to provide the, the minerals and elements that we need and we're not developing here. So it looks like there's a miscommunication between the administration and what members of Congress are, are working towards and it uh, kind of in opposite directions. I yield back. If you'd like to respond, it's okay. I'm I don't want to tie up any more time. Just to endorse the idea that there's going to be a lot of different things we've got to do at the same time. Uh, we simply think anything that we're responsible for, especially using technologies that exist and that American workers are making good money building right now, are those that show the most promise and those that we've got to push the hardest on. Thank you. Um, chair now recognizes Mr. Allred for five minutes. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to thank... Um, Chairman DeFazio for holding this hearing. Secretary Buttigieg, it's, it's great to see you. Thanks for coming uh, to Dallas and seeing some of the good things that we have going on there. I want to thank the department for getting uh, the historic funding uh, from this bill that I was proud to vote for out as quickly as you have. Uh, these dollars are making an already a monumental impact on my community and communities across Texas. In fact, last month, uh, the Texas Department of Transportation released its plan to build out an EV charging infrastructure uh, throughout the state to support one million electric vehicles. Uh, thanks to the IIJA, uh, the state is expected to receive about $407 million over five years to do that. Now, as you know, uh, you've been to Texas, it's a big state, we've got some big distances involved. I'm, I'm wondering you know, how you propose uh, working with state DOTs that are similar to Texas, uh, they build a reliable uh, network of stations that addresses range, anxiety uh, that maybe some consumers have and allow us to really make this a success? Well, thank you. We, we recognize that uh, for your community, communities across Texas and, and many in the U.S., uh, the ability to, to successfully participate in the EV revolution, to get the fuel savings that come with owning an EV, are only as good as your opportunities to charge them. And especially if your work uh, or your commute requires you to cover long distances on a regular basis, we've got to make sure that it is as, uh, as, as certain that you'll find chargers where you need them as it is that you'll find gas stations where you need them on a, on a road trip today. Uh, with the funding that Congress has provided, we have uh, formula dollars going to every state. This uh, year's slice of that, $615 million. Uh, to make sure that there is that backbone across the highway network. And I'll say this was crafted with a, a lot of regard for the differences between the states. Uh, we don't know what the right way is to, to lay it out in, in um, every particular. So we've uh, asked the states to prepare their plans and then file them with us by August 1st. As long as they meet uh, the, the legal requirements, uh, then we'll be off and running on funding them and look forward to seeing what, what Texas and the other states uh, prepare for us. Yeah, I, I think it's exciting. You know, in a former life, I was um, an NFL player, and I was inter interested to see in the last Super Bowl, every car commercial was for an electric vehicle, mm. right? I mean, this is what I think people are excited about. But for states like Texas, for us to, to move into that future, we need this uh, charging infrastructure. And so I think it's, a, it's a, an incredibly important aspect of this bill. I also want to talk about aviation. Um, as you know, DFW is home to one of our busiest aviation sectors. Um, we were home to the second busiest airport in the world, Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. Uh, in 2016, it received recognition as the first airport to become carbon neutral uh, in North America. Uh, recently, DFW uh, received $35 million from FAA to increase terminal sustainability and assist the airport in reaching its net zero emissions goal uh, by 2030. 
And I'm wondering how the department uh, envisions airports using the airport improvement program funds from IIJA to help build capacity at the airports. And if you believe uh, these funds will help with some of the delays uh, that I certainly have been hearing about and also experiencing as a, somebody who flies twice a week, uh, most weeks, uh, and cancellations that I think so many folks are here in the country are feeling. Thank you. Yes, we, we were uh, very pleased to support DFW's application through the terminal program that's going to help them with the power plant and I think uh, uh, yield not only uh, air quality improvements and, and sustainability improvements, but also I think cost savings for, for the airport in the, in the long run, which means uh, whatever those uh, fees do go to maybe are, are more likely to be passenger uh, facing than if they were just right. going into the heating and cooling bill, uh, which which we certainly welcome. You mentioned the uh, the other program, the airport in, uh, improvement program, AIP, which uh, is funded to the tune of uh, 3.35 billion in the president's fiscal year 23 budget request. And um, those are dollars that we think will help enhance uh, capacity as well as uh, safety, security, and, and other concerns at, at the airports. And uh, so uh, that will be part of a stack alongside the other uh, sets of aviation funding that came in, in the infrastructure law that can really help us on, on everything from uh, you know, physical plant improvements around the airport, uh, the, the runway, the apron, the, the gates, um, to, uh, uh, to things like uh, air traffic control facilities that uh, if you allow them to deteriorate can also become a limiting factor, uh, not to mention a quality of life issue for our very hardworking air traffic controllers. Uh, all of those call for investment. We're glad that we're able to deliver so much of it now thanks to the bipartisan law. Absolutely. Well, I know I'm almost out of time here. I, I just want to say I'm happy. Was happy to hear you say recently you plan to use the funds from I, IJA to establish high-speed rail uh, demonstration projects in the country. And if, if you could briefly elaborate on how uh, the department plans to deliver on that goal and how much of the funding do you plan to allocate towards high-speed rail projects, just very briefly. Sure. So in, in a nutshell, it, it's enough not to build out a full high-speed rail network across the U.S., but to begin to demonstrate that the U.S. can do high-speed rail as effectively as anyone. And we look forward to uh, uh, supporting as many routes as possible. It'll probably be a handful uh, stacked alongside all the other rail needs in the U.S., uh, but enough, I hope, uh, to show that America can lead here as well. Well, certainly one in Texas. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. We'll go to Mr. Nels for five minutes. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Part of the genius of the Founding Fathers was a system of checks and balances. Congress has a duty to oversee the executive branch, and members of Congress deserve answers to questions they pose to the executive branch. My office has written several letters to you, and we have not received a response on most of them. I sent you a letter back on May 2nd asking you a very simple question about whether the Biden administration supports maintaining a preferential no-fly zone for Disney. Uh, did you ever receive that letter? Did you read it? Uh, I believe we have it, yes. Okay. Mind you, that no other amusement park enjoys restrictions on airspace, including competitors like Universal Studios. These no-fly zones are usually reserved for high-security targets like the White House and our most sensitive military facilities like nuclear launch sites. It totally makes sense. I would like to add no executive agency wrote to Congress about a national security need for this no-fly zone, which is the custom. The Obama administrator's, administration's FAA administrator testified that Disney, Disney's no-fly zone does not meet the standard requirements and would not be in place had Congress not enacted specific legislation, a process that has been widely reported that was done out of uncouth lobbying. So uh, what is the administration's stance on the preferential treatment for Disney's no-fly zone? Well, uh, of course, fundamentally, we simply have to apply the law. And as, in this case, as, as you noted, uh, this uh, set of uh, flight restrictions that the FAA maintains uh, we do so because it's uh, part of uh, congressional uh, legislation that was enacted in, in 2004. Uh, and then we codify those in uh, notices to, to air emissions. Uh, I know that we have had uh, inquiries both from uh, members of Congress from time to time and, and from industry about this. Uh, and uh, ultimately, uh, any changes to that policy would, would be for Congress to, uh, uh, to put forward just as the policy itself has, uh, has come from congressional statute. Fair enough, and thank you, and I will be pursuing just that here in the next Congress. And, and uh, could you please, and just in one word, let's have some fun with this. Could you please describe America to me in one single word? What would that be if you could describe America 
in one single word. Well, for me, I guess home. Home. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, just a few weeks ago, this is how President Biden described America in one word. Could you please tell me what that word means? It's this one right here. Mm -hmm. Could you even say the word? Carson, I'm not in the habit of trying to read transcriptions. I bring this up to you, sir. I bring this up to you on television. because you yourself questioned Donald Trump's mental state of mind in September of 2019 when you stated to CNN, I quote, if our presidency is not in good shape, then our country is not in good shape. And Mr. Secretary, I could not agree with you more. I'm going to repeat what your quote is. If our presidency is not in good shape, then our country is not in good shape. Inflation's at 9.1%. Gas prices are through the roof. Our adversaries are exploiting our weaknesses across the globe. And our southern border is non-existent. This administration puts the American people last. The left and the dishonest media, which in my humble opinion is the greatest threat to this country, the dishonest media, began questioning President Trump's mental state back in February of 2017, a month into his presidency. We now have President Biden in office for 18 months, and just recently, we now see the mainstream media questioning President Biden's mental state, and for good reason. Sadly, he shakes hands with ghosts and imaginary people. He falls off bicycles. Even at the White House Easter celebration, the Easter Bunny had to guide him back into his safe place. Cue cards that say, sit here, or end of speech, which he actually states, that is, if he stays awake. So my question for you is, sir, have you spoken with any other cabinet members about implementing the 25th Amendment on President Biden? First of all, I'm glad to have a president who can ride a bicycle. And I will look beyond the, the insulting nature of that question and make clear to you that the President Have of the United States... Have you spoken to any other cabinet not. members about implementing the 25th Amendment on President Biden? The, of course please not. Please allow the you witness to know answer. Have, Have you emailed... This is United my time. States. Have you emailed any members the with the United executive States. branch about the President's health the or president cognitive decline, the United States including text messages from your private or phone. Boss, as I have I never had the pleasure this. of working with. What about a political appointees at USDOT? Have you spoken about... Gentleman's time has expired. I couldn't hear the question, I'm sorry. Well, Will you yield me one minute, sir? Absolutely not. If you, if you had uh, yielded uh, the Secretary some time to actually answer the ridiculous question, you might have actually gotten something. We will now... Um, We'll now uh, turn to Mr. Garcia for five minutes. Mr. Van Drew, Mr. Thank Van you. Drew would like uh, to yield Mr. me. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member for convening this hearing. And of course, thanks to Secretary Buttigieg for joining us today. The IIJA is, was an important bill uh, that funds, meet, that funds uh, our uh, policy needs. As the chairman reminded us last week, uh, as his portrait uh, was being unveiled, the House passed a truly game-changing, transformative bill that we call the Invest Act, establishing greenhouse gas emissions metrics, advancing a fix-it first agenda, and massive investments in environmental justice initiatives, to name a few. Even though we weren't able to advance the Invest Act or the Build Back Better Act, I am heartened that under your leadership, Mr. Secretary, the U.S. DOT has begun to implement parts of this progressive agenda under its existing authorities. Still, more must be done, and how we implement the IIJA is absolutely critical. For far too long, transportation policy has been disconnected from the broader social justice debate. Yet it determines access to jobs, clean air, clean water, affordable housing, and the fate of our climate. Mr. Secretary, I represent a working class immigrant community in Chicago and in the Cook County suburbs. And as you know, Chicago is a hub for rail, air, and truck transportation. Our communities deal with both the good and the bad of that. My neighborhood, Little Village, has some of the highest asthma and respiratory diseases in the country. And unfortunately, pollution from our transit corridors uh, plays a big role in that. We have to be honest about the policies that led us here 
and deliberate about setting a new path. Mr. Secretary, approximately how much of IIJA money is going to expand highways and add lanes? Uh, so I'd have to pull the uh, uh, exact funding, and of course some of that will uh, depend on how the states and project sponsors uh, choose to allocate funding that can go either toward transit or highways in the formula case. Uh, and uh, on the discretionary side could go toward projects that are uh, more or less uh, highway intensive. But what, what I'll say also is that uh, you know, this legislation gives us the means to look beyond the 1950s, 60s, or 70s mentality about transportation that often uh, really uh, uh, subjected any mode other than single occupancy vehicles to the back burner. And when we do, as, as you uh, wisely note, the benefit is not only in terms of uh, more convenient, equitable, and, and, and decent ways to get around, uh, but also the physical health of people who aren't subjected to as many emissions uh, when we have more thoughtful uh, and uh, uh, more wide-ranging options for people to get around, including active transportation and excellent public transit. Excellent point. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the GHG uh, performance measure is a great step, but what else is uh, DOT doing to help ensure that the IIJA is part of the solution to emissions and climate change? Well, certainly I would point to the carbon reduction program, which uh, provides dedicated funding for the purpose of uh, making transportation investments that reduce the carbon intensity of the U.S. transportation sector. Uh, but that's far from the only a set of resources that are gonna make a big difference. Uh, again, uh, pretty much any investment that you make in transit is likely to reduce uh, carbon emissions, but it's that much more so, so on, on investments like the uh, low and no emission bus program, which helps uh, local jurisdictions and transit authorities to acquire uh, clean, efficient, uh, electric, or otherwise low emission um, buses for their route, saving taxpayer money in the long run when they do so. Uh, we've got $7.5 billion for building out the electric charging infrastructure across the country, including, importantly, uh, $2.5 billion, which is allowing us to make community charging investments, knowing that there are some places, often low-income places, where fuel savings might mean the most to a family if they could access uh, an EV, uh, but where it might not yet be profitable to install one. And so we think we can uh, buy down that difference and, and stimulate uh, access to, uh, uh, to EVs uh, in multifamily dwellings, for example, in, uh, in dense neighborhoods, just as we're building out that network across the U.S. on the longer stretches of highway. So just about every corner of, of our uh, infrastructure policy uh, holds the, the promise of uh, helping us combat the climate challenge, and we're committed to making sure that uh, we do everything that the law provides for us to do in that regard. Uh, absolutely. Uh, as you know, the uh, transportation sector is one of the most unionized uh, sectors in the country. Can you speak to how U.S. DOT is going to put those principles into practice? Uh, yes, we, uh, uh, we, we know that it's uh, vitally important to, to do so. And uh, I think that uh, what we really need to make sure of is to engage all of the players who have an opportunity to participate in the, uh, the workforce of the future, because this is not just a question of fairness, although that's reason enough uh, to ensure that we're uh, bringing in people from backgrounds that have been excluded from these labor opportunities in the past uh, and supporting uh, high paying, good jobs with the opportunity to join a union. Uh, but it's also simply gonna be necessary in order for us to get the work done, uh, because this will require more of the American people and the American workforce than perhaps any national undertaking since World War II. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary and Mr. Chair, you're back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Ms. Van Dyne for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I appreciate you being here today, Secretary Buttigieg. It's good to see you again, and I'm always going to call you mayor just because that's, that's how I know you. Um, I appreciate you coming to the DFW airport, um, and I'm glad that you were able to meet with my, uh, my colleague um, from Texas. Mm -hmm. DFW airport is smack dab in the middle of my district. I'm a former board member, so next time you come in town, mm -hmm more than 24 hours notice would really be appreciated so that I can make sure that I'm actually, I'm actually there. Um, interesting comment about the EVs earlier from my colleague from New Jersey. The, the, the quote was made that as more people uh, buy EVs, the price of gas goes down. Uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, but we've got more people driving EVs now than we ever have in our history, and I haven't seen anything but gas prices go up. Part of the concern is that we, as we continue to see the incentives for EVs, um, they seem to be getting a free ride on our highways, even though because of their, their weight, 
uh, considerable weight um, over gas guzzling, to use that quote, uh, uh, um, other vehicles, that they're no doubt causing more damage to the roads. So are you concerned that the weight of the EVs and their lack of paying for the roads that they're driving on? I mean, my chief concern is, okay, if, if less people are paying gas taxes because we're giving that pass to EVs, they're causing more of the damage. We're not going to have the maintenance on that. So I think there, there's two sides of the coin to think about. Uh, on one hand, as, 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 you, uh, as you point out, uh, EVs don't pay, uh, if it's a full, fully electric vehicle, you're not paying the gas tax, which is traditionally how we've uh, funded the Highway Trust Fund. On the other hand, uh, we know that uh, ultimately there will be less expense to Medicaid, for example, for fewer children uh, suffering from asthma that's a consequence of living near areas that have a lot of traffic with uh, traditional combustion vehicles. Uh, we know that uh, there are very real dollars and cents costs to allowing climate change to continue to accelerate. So I, I'm so concerned we need to right balance now. Those yeah, I'm things. concerned right now on paying for our infrastructure bill, this massive mm -hmm. infrastructure bill that we just passed. Mm -hmm. And you just took away the pay for if everybody, if you're incentivizing them to pay to drive EVs. We have no pay now, and they're causing considerable amount of damage on the on the roads. Right, so a couple things here. One, as you know, the, the IAJA uh, sought to use not increased user fees, but uh, other sources of funding in order to uh, make those investments possible. But two, uh, the, you know, this legislation, following in line with previous transportation bills, created pilots for states to look at alternatives for how they want to fund uh, uh, their roads for those that rely on gas taxes, as many states do. And we recognize different states are going to come up with different approaches here. We think we'll learn a lot from them. Uh, I think it's relatively early in that process, but we're interested to see the Yeah, data the problem with it being early in the process is we've already passed the bill. We just don't have any way of paying for it. So while we can set up these test projects in other states, the fact is, is that we're already going to have that debt and we've got no pay for for it. Well, it's not that we have no pay for for it. It's just that we don't have the tradition. We, we will have less revenue from electric vehicles into the particular pay for that has been favored by Congress in the past. It. So we're going to have to find it somewhere else in the budget. Right. So typically it's been general fund, and, and that's one yeah. way to do it, but far from the only way. Yeah. Um, you know, in many instances, you are empowered and directed by Congress to ensure that federal laws protect transportation workers, passengers, and the movement of goods. Consistent federal standards help to protect interstate commerce and prevent a state or circuit court from making decisions that would impact the entire country or from creating conflicting standards around the country, which would make compliance confusing, impossible, or unnecessarily costly. Are you concerned about the challenges to the department's federal authority that would create a patchwork of state regulations? And specifically, I'm talking about um, what's happening in California. Hmm. So there's always a balance that, that we know it has to be struck uh, principally between Congress and the courts on, uh, and the states on what ought to be a federal power and what ought to be a state power. Uh, we think that often things seem to go best when the uh, federal standard amounts to a floor not a ceiling. And then some states uh, who want to make sure that there's even more done for the well-being of their workers or for health or whatever the particular thing is that they regulate. Well, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, my, my, my time is rapidly going down, but do you know how many DOT registered motor carriers have only one truck? Uh, no, I don't. So it's about 300,000. So as we continue to see crisis after crisis with our supply chain, what would happen to our supply chain, the country, and these small business owners if the U.S. were to ban their ability to work as independent contractors for large motor carriers? Well, we'd certainly need to find a way for them to be able to work effectively, uh, if not in traditional uh, models, then, then in new ones. But again, that's uh, something that's being resolved between the courts and the state right now. We're not a party to that, uh, that litigation. So you don't think that the DOT has any, any um, play in what's happening to basically cut our supply chain countrywide? Well, of course, we have a lot of play in what's happening to our supply chain. But you're, you're that's why I work on it all the time. We're just not party to the litigation. No, but are you planning on getting involved at all, or are you just waiting for the courts to decide? Oh, we're working on dozens of things related to truck driver availability, but in this particular regard, we're not a party to the litigation. Okay. Right, Gentlewoman's time has expired. Uh, five minutes. Mr. Auchincloss, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Secretary, welcome back. Uh, we appreciate your engagement in this, uh, in this hearing. And... For me, as somebody who's worked in the future of mobility in the private sector, in the public sector, in academia, it's just so heartening to have a secretary of the transportation department, uh, a former mayor who took on parking minimums and who understands that we need to move our infrastructure away from car-centric planning and development and towards a, a future of human-centric infrastructure and, and walkability. Uh, 
After the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure bill, I held one-on-one -on -one meetings with leaders of every city and town in my district to hear about their infrastructure priorities. There are a lot, but one overarching one is expanding commuter rail access. And in uh, Newton, Massachusetts, the commuter rail there, the three stations that comprise it, is not currently fully ADA accessible. As your department prepares to issue your NOFO for the All Stations Accessibility Program, can you discuss both the timeline for applications as well as the criteria you, that you'll use beyond local, state, federal alignment? Well, thank you. The, the All Stations Accessibility Program is going to provide unprecedented dedicated resources to help upgrade legacy rail stations for, for people with disabilities. And it's worth noting that uh, a great many legacy rail stations that were built before 1990 and the ADA are not accessible. In fact, uh, uh, about 25%, so, so that's 927 stations across 17 systems, uh, remain inaccessible. It's one of the reasons why we understand the, the sense of urgency about putting these dollars to work. Uh, this year's slice of the program, based on the funding Congress provided, will be uh, about $350 million, and we're uh, uh, close to being able to put out the, the notice of funding opportunity. Matter of fact, I think by the end of the month, we'll be able to do that. It's a new program every time, and we have over 40 new programs. Uh, of course, it takes a little more time to bring together than uh, new iterations of the programs that have been there all along. Uh, but I still believe we'll be able to make award announcements by later on this year. And uh, the, the NOFA will have more inf information about how we're going to prioritize. But I expect we'll get a lot of applications because we know the need is very great. Well, Secretary, I'd welcome you in the district to come tour the new commuter rail station and see the opportunities inherent in, uh, in improving it. I'd like to also ask you about microtransit. Uh, this technology has helped transform communities by providing affordable and flexible transit solutions, often by ensuring critical connections to pre-existing transit hubs and filling so-called transit deserts in underserved urban and rural areas. And earlier this year, 14 of my colleagues and I sent you a letter urging you to provide flexibility in the IIJA programs for the inclusion of on-demand transit. I'd appreciate hearing your thoughts on how the department's gonna support and encourage the use of microtransit across the country as you implement the IIJA. So, We've seen how beneficial and um, uh, how filled with potential microtransit is. I think it's also safe to say it just wasn't what uh, uh, folks had in mind when most of our U.S. transportation policy and legislation was set up. So part of what we're trying to do is find ways to flex funding within existing programs uh, to make clear uh, when we're confident that, that the law will allow for it that jurisdictions can do this. A good example is... Uh, 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 CMAC, the, the um, congestion, congestion Mitigation Air Quality Funding, has a lot of flex eligibilities. Um, but working with federal highways, we think we can do that in a, in a number of, of existing programs like the Highway Safety Improvement Program and work it into the, some of the new ones we're bringing online like the Safe Streets for All program. Uh, we've seen successful micro-mobility programs all over the country, including, I would note, not just in cities where I think people easily imagine scooters or, or e-bikes being used, uh, but also in, in rural areas from, from Alabama to, to Delaware. And uh, we also have some FTA research and demonstration funds that in certain circumstances can be used to help here. Uh, and I think, you know, this really is part of the answer for the long run on how that first or last mile works for people interacting with the transit system going forward. Uh, so and we want to do everything we can to be flexible and supportive here. That's terrific. And I would also add that in addition to micromobility, on-demand transit as well to fill those transit deserts is critical. I want to give you, Secretary, the last 30 seconds just to talk about airline staffing. I know you're frustrated. My constituents are frustrated, and I'm frustrated about the cancellations. You've been on top of it. Can you explain uh, what you're working on this summer? Thank you. Uh, you know, we were especially concerned after uh, the Memorial Day travel weekend and disruptions that happened here. And it's clear that while we welcome the fact that demand has returned, passengers are, are, are going back on those vacations that they had put off, uh, either because of uh, uh, financial or, or uh, uh, direct COVID concerns or both, uh, we're seeing now that the airlines aren't prepared to, to meet that demand in many cases. Uh, I'll say we've seen a number of steps since the, those conversations uh, that I had with airline leadership that I think are very positive. Uh, we've seen increased pay, including a lot of regional carriers, uh, which have struggled most to hold on to pilots. Uh, we've seen more attention going into customer service and, and staffing customer service. And uh, on, on the, F, the FAA side, we're working on anything we can do to make sure that AT, air traffic control resources are allocated in ways that are helpful, too. Secretary, uh, there's a long I'm, way to I'm go. over time, so I, I have to cut you off there. Maybe another member wants to give you some time more to talk about airline staffing. But I yield back. 
Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, I recognize Mr. Rouser for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Secretary. Uh, great to see you. It's uh, good to have, uh, have you here in person uh, in the committee. In fact, I think this might be one of the first uh, committee hearings uh, we've had where the witnesses have, have been here live or the, the witnesses here live. So thank you for being here. Um, I'll get right to the point, but I'll preface it uh, with this. Uh, uh, you know, we all understand that uh, you need to have rules for the road, um, but you don't necessarily need a, uh, a stoplight every, every 10 feet. And uh, that's kind of sums up my uh, philosophy as it relates to, to uh, regulatory structure. And uh, to that end, I uh, note that according to the Council of Environmental Quality, uh, the average time for an EIS or environmental impact statement under the NEPA process was more than seven years for FAA and the Federal Highway Administration projects uh, before the Trump administration streamlined NEPA in 2020. Uh, but of course, as you know, uh, this this administration has uh, reversed those efforts uh, as it relates to NEPA. And so I'm just curious, uh, how, do we, how do we reconcile the immediate need for big infrastructure projects uh, with the administration's efforts to prolong and, and really delay important projects? So, you know, time is money, and uh, there are a number of us that feel like those NEPA reforms were very much needed uh, and very helpful uh, had they been allowed to, uh, to be implemented fully rather than being reversed. We think it, we can deliver projects promptly and swiftly without throwing uh, environmental or other concerns out the window, and, and we're committed to finding ways to, to make sure that the process goes as smoothly as possible. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law provides a lot of the uh, terms for doing that, including uh, starting a, a short clock on a process that we met, I think, within 60 days. Uh, on categorical exclusions, uh, as well as things that are going to be more long-term in terms of measures to make the process easier to navigate or make it simpler in some way. I do want to point out that, that uh, on our transportation, certainly our federal highway uh, programs, 98% uh, of them fall under a categorical exclusion, which means we can usually turn that around in, in about a month. Uh, but there are those longer EIS and EA processes where uh, the, uh, uh, as you say, time is money, and uh, it, it's very important while meeting the requirements of the law and making sure that, that the processes have been followed, that there's no unnecessary delay or redundancy. And uh, I, I think, again, the infrastructure law sets us up for that by calling for that two-year uh, median or, or average. We're working to make sure we're on track for that. Uh, and other measures that I think will help, too. Well, <clears throat> all that sounds good, but uh, I don't really think uh, in practicality that's, that's truly the case. But for time's sake, uh, I need to move on to a couple other things. Uh, with regard to the short line uh, freight rail industry, uh, a couple things uh, as it relates to this. I've, obviously, you're familiar uh, with the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvements uh, Grant Program. Uh, the uh, infrastructure bill uh, added uh, some more resources for that. Uh, can you uh, comment on the department's commitment towards using uh, that particular program to invest in key safety goals like allowing short line freight rail to upgrade and make important repairs? And then quick follow up to that, uh, do you agree the program helps short line railroads improve the efficiency of the supply chain? Thanks for the question. I think uh, shoreline railroads are more important than ever, as we've seen in the context of the renewed attention to the supply chain. So we need to make sure that we're supporting them. Uh, around the time we rolled out the, the Chrissy grants for, for this year, I had the pleasure of visiting one in, in Michigan, and we know there are uh, similar ones across the country. So when it comes to the Chrissy program, which uh, our, our last round was uh, $368 million, uh, and uh, we'll have uh, that much more funding thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, we certainly see that this is going to be a, a, a very important source of support for um, for all, all railroads, certainly to include short lines. Yeah, given that's the case, I'm a little bit um, perplexed, uh, though, that the department is moving forward with a new crew staffing rule that uh, could require railroads to hire more personnel or operate with more people on a train than is uh, necessary. Uh, now, if that goes forward over time, it could force hundreds of small business short line uh, freight railroads to make artificial and inefficient economic and management decisions instead of putting those uh, resources into capital improvements to track, for example, structures that are critical for the efficient uh, movement of goods and, and services. Um, why is USDOT considering forcing these small businesses to hire workers they don't need uh, when, in fact, quite frankly, it's hard to find a worker uh, anyway? 
Well, the reason for the rule is safety, and I don't want to preempt uh, what's coming, I think, uh, any day now, actually, in terms of NPRM that'll have more, more of the specifics. But uh, the intention here is, is to make sure that uh, we continue to meet our fundamental obligation as a department to ensure that, uh, uh, that we have uh, safety for workers and anybody who comes into contact with, with our uh, rail system while being as, as uh, uh, straightforward and as reasonable as possible for the benefit of a, uh, a goods movement fluidity. Well, again, that sounds good, but uh, I, I don't necessarily think, uh, in fact, I know that's not necessary. I, they ought to be allowed to uh, invest their resources uh, in, in areas where it's going to create more efficiency and allow for uh, us to overcome these supply chain challenges. Uh, Madam Chair, my time's expired. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I recognize Ms. Bordeaux. Ms. Bordeaux, you are recognized you. for five minutes. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, Ranking Member for holding today's hearing. And thank you, Secretary Buttigieg for being here today. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I wanna start by thanking you for visiting Georgia's seventh congressional district last summer. It was a pleasure to have you and show you all the innovative work going on at Peachtree Corners around autonomous vehicles and electric charging. And please know that you are always welcome back. Last year, members of this committee and our colleagues in the Senate came together to pass the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, a historic and bipartisan once-in-a-generation investment in our nation's physical infrastructure. Like many of my colleagues here today, I was proud to support this legislation and I'm grateful for the administration's partnership in getting the money out the door to our partners on the ground. Um, there's a lot to talk about here, but just to focus on a couple issues that are really important to Georgia's seventh congressional district. Um, one is uh, microtransit and the other is electric vehicles. Um, I know that you have already answered some of my questions about microtransit uh, when some other, uh, my colleagues uh, asked them earlier. I just wanna reiterate, it's very, very important. Uh, my district is a suburban community. Uh, it's been hard to get consensus around uh, bus rapid transit and other forms of transit. And so microtransit is very, very helpful, particularly for our cities, which form these important hubs uh, all over the district. And uh, I hear from people all the time about how much they, they really appreciate the microtransit we've been able to get in and how much more they would like to see uh, of that particular uh, innovation in our community. Um, talking about electric vehicles, I'm very proud of the, uh, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program and glad to see that the state of Georgia uh, received nearly 20 million in fiscal year 22 as a part of 135 million over five years uh, to support efforts to expand uh, EV charging across the state. So just touching on that for a few minutes, um, could you talk a little bit about whether there have been hurdles uh, getting the new uh, National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program off the ground? And then also how the administration has prioritized consumer experience uh, to ensure it is easy, consistent, and mirrors their current experience at the pump. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for the great visit we had uh, to Georgia and, and some very impressive things we saw, both in terms of uh, uh, policy and in terms of technology on the ground. Um, and uh, it, as your, your question hints, there, there's uh, uh, tons of opportunity, but a lot of challenge in getting it right with this electric vehicle infrastructure, especially because uh, we've not had something like this at scale in the U.S. It's uh, very different from uh, the infrastructure for fueling gas cars, and we need to be mindful of that as we go. One thing we're thinking about in particular with regard to the consumer experience is making sure that, that uh, these charging stations are interoperable and uh, are available. Uh, you can imagine if, uh, if uh, you're taking a road trip and uh, every, uh, every third or fourth gas pump didn't work, or if you had to be a member of a particular gas station chain in order to, in order to even use the pump, uh, that would uh, not be a, a positive or efficient experience. But uh, in some places and in some cases in the past, uh, that's what some EV drivers have faced. And so we need to make sure that we're not only getting the dots in the right places on the maps, uh, but uh, paying attention to the quality as well as the quantity of, uh, of these EV charging stations, especially uh, those that would be supported with taxpayer funds. So those are some of the things that, that are on our mind as we work in close collaboration with my colleagues at the Department of Energy through these issues. And I have to say, uh, it is, uh, in my view, a, a remarkably positive example of interagency cooperation 
to see uh, how the Department of Energy has teamed up with the DOT to work through these issues. Somewhere we have more expertise, somewhere they have more expertise. Uh, put our heads together and get a good plan going to, uh, uh, to meet the president's goals. Okay. And just to follow up on that, um, we recently uh, had a company, Siemens, that rolled out some innovative new electric charging uh, infrastructure that can be easily deployed uh, to gas stations or convenience stores. Uh, but the challenge is the grid and the ability to plug into the grid so we can get the basic technology on the ground. Um, what is going on with that? How are you all thinking about integrating the overhaul of the grid that's required uh, in order to support electric vehicle charging? Well, there's no way we're going to be able to run tomorrow's cars on yesterday's grid. And it's one of the reasons why we're thankful for the ways that the infrastructure, infrastructure law contemplates and supports upgrades uh, for America's electrical infrastructure. And here, I'll yield to the Department of Energy, which has more of the day-to-day -day expertise on this work. Uh, but again, we're integrating it with our work on the EV side through that, that joint office. And, and we know that's vitally important because uh, we need to have the electric, uh, uh, the backbone of electric infrastructure to support the electric charging infrastructure that we're funding. General Woman's time Thank has you. expired. Uh, I recognize Ms. Steele for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ranking Member Graves. Once again, uh, California state has that has 40% of nation's imported goods and 30% of the nation's exported goods moving through just two of its ports, Los Angeles and Long Beach. It's implementing AB5, a law that will worsen the nation's supply chain crisis by upending the independent contractor model used by the trucking industry. Mr. Secretary, as AB5 would impact 70,000 truckers alone just in California, what is your department doing to lessen the impact of the, this bill on our national economy? Well, the uh, availability of uh, trucking workers is a critically important part of the supply chain challenge. It's one of the reasons why we've been uh, working on this from day one, taking measures both to help recruit new truck drivers and to support the kind of job quality improvements that we believe will help us to retain uh, more truck drivers in the career. Uh, our Bureau of Transportation Statistics estimates that uh, some 300,000 people leave the profession on a yearly basis, and uh, we've taken steps that we think have successfully helped to move the needle on some of those systemic challenges. So we're going to continue those efforts. They're all uh, in uh, line with the President's Trucking Action Plan, and we'll continue doing that as we wait for more information and guidance from the state of California about uh, state policies. But this, uh, you know, shortage of drivers is part of it, but not just the shortage of drivers, but in California, these independent truckers cannot really come in. So you are co-chair of supply chain task force. And I know that you developed the trucking action plan, but I've been seeing you and other members of administration encourage the IL. WU, International Longshore and Warehouse Union, and PMA, Pacific Maritime Association, to come to the table to keep freight flowing through LA and Long Beach. Why aren't you doing the same for independent truckers? Because as of now that we have so much shortage of trucking drive truckers, and these independent truckers can come in. I think that's gonna reduce our supply chain crisis much more. So why shouldn't they get the same type of exemptions that gig workers and entertainers get who are in emphasis for the law? Well, again, to the extent that this is a state law, we respect the, the, the role of the state of California. We're in touch with them, and, and we know that uh, they have uh, indicated that the California Labor Agency is, is working uh, with those who need assistance coming into compliance and uh, that they are looking at the supply chain factors, too. Um, this is one piece of a very big puzzle, and we are uh, doing everything we can on the pieces that are up to us federally, uh, while respecting the areas in which we are uh, uh, not uh, formally part of the process. So you're not really working with, uh, Governor Newsom just visited last week here, 
and you never had a meeting with him, that you know what, he could not to actually um, declare the state of emergency bypass AB5. So, you know, it's gonna actually loosen up a little more of the supply chain crisis. So you never really did that. And what that California Tracking Association sued, that Supreme Court did, refused to hear that what that's gonna be really impacting for this supply chain crisis. So again, we're not part of the uh, the lawsuit that, that you referred to, or we're, we're not a party to it, um, and uh, it doesn't have a, a federal procedural role in that sense. Uh, we are uh, obviously uh, uh, continuing to monitor anything and everything that can affect throughput in uh, in our ports or in any part of the goods movement system in the U.S. And uh, we will work with uh, any party that uh, has ideas or has needs. Uh, in order to make sure that uh, goods keep moving as they need to. Just my last question is, so you have a communication open between uh, governor's office, California governor's office and your department to solve this problem. So we will respect the role of the state, but always be uh, prepared to engage on anything we can do to be supportive or helpful uh, toward the goal of making sure there's uh, good throughput. Thank you very much. I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. I recognize uh, Mr. DeSanyoye for five minutes. You Thank you, recognized. Madam Chairwoman. I appreciate that. Mr. Secretary, it's delightful to see you. Thank you for your really extraordinary work on this. We always sort of miss, I think, some of my colleagues have mentioned the historic nature of this and how difficult it's been for both Republican and Democratic administrations to get this bill. Uh, I want to specifically talk to you as somebody who uh, served three different governors on the California Air Resources Board and served on the California Transportation Commission and has um, put a lot of time in the last 25 years in alternative fuels and our renewable portfolio standard. And I was also the author of some of the conversation in the legislature of our VMT bill uh, with the full expectation that that's where we would recover our funding, California has 42% of the EV and fuel cell market in the United States, uh, but we have the chicken and egg problem with infrastructure. So I wanna to talk to you about that. Um, I was very, very happy that a bill that's priority for mine was incorporated into the infrastructure bill, the Clean Quarters Bill, uh, to provide this infrastructure. We have a proportionate amount of infrastructure, uh, but putting it in the right place to make it effective. And we can see this in the private sector and Madam Chair, I'd like to submit for the record an article for Forbes magazine. It's entitled Every Automaker's EV Plans Through 2035 and Beyond, if I could. It is, it is, you're, it's been received. Thank you. Let me just read, this is from Forbes magazine. So for my colleagues who wonder where the marketplace is going and respects the marketplace, the marketplace is clearly going away from uh, internal combustion engines. There's a place for it, there's a transition, uh, but this isn't pie in the sky uh, as somebody who's been involved with this and realizes the frustration with battery technology. Uh, we are also on the, just on the cusp of uh, exponential change on affordability and range and durability on a battery electric. So the beginning sentence of this article in Forbes magazine is, and I quote, there's no longer any doubt that the auto industry is going electric. So to your point about Brandeis and states being the, the laboratories of discovery, I understand that different states are gonna have different pathways. We are, as you I'm sure know, uh, in places like the Bay Area, uh, early adapters. The car companies tell me that. That's why we're moving to this. Uh, not better or worse, it's just the marketplace. So how do we get this infrastructure in a thoughtful way out to make it work? The Chinese are adding 4,000 EV stations a day. They're, they're adding over 100,000 EV and fuel cell stations a month. Uh, we have a little over 100,000 in the United States. So the private sector is going in and trying to fill this out. But when I talk to the private sector, both the, the car manufacturers and the energy manufacturers, we in California have our renewable portfolio standard. So it's now going to 50% uh, by 2030. So from well to wheel, getting that energy clean and efficient and then the point I think we miss here is the importance of our economy to transition 
to this energy source and to do it efficiently. So how do we do that in the significant investment in this bill that you've been such a leader on and do it but in a thoughtful way? Those 12 states that represent over 60% of GDP and the, and the vehicle mark, market in the United States that follows CARB's leadership under the California waiver, the Clean Air Act, how do we strategically do this? So I, I agree that the um, one thing is certain, which is this is where industry is headed and this is where the world is, hurting, uh, is headed. I think while that one thing is certain, at least three important things are not. Will it happen quickly enough to meet our climate challenge? Will it happen in a way that America leads? And will it happen in a way that's equitable for everyone? And those are the considerations that guide our involvement with things like the federal support for charging stations. Uh, if we get it right, what we'll be doing is accelerating it so that it, it helps us meet our climate goals. Uh, presenting an American alternative to that Chinese model that, uh, that you mentioned is, is gathering steam there. Uh, and reach people who might otherwise be left out of the transition, at least in its early stages, knowing some of the upfront costs that are, uh, that are involved, knowing that charging infrastructure isn't often available in lower income areas, even though provided they could afford to purchase or, or, or use uh, an EV, it's low income drivers who would benefit the most from the fuel savings that come with having one. Uh, so those are the principles that, that guide the, the way that we're uh, framing both the $5 billion in formula funds that the states will uh, will execute according to their plans, and then the $2.5 billion for discretionary work that we'll do to effectively fill in the gaps in communities. And we think taken together, we have the tools that, that will allow us to then stimulate that much more private sector involvement too, uh, which can help make sure we actually do this as quickly as the, the economy and, and the climate need us to. Thank you. Exciting. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I recognize uh, Mr. Weber for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Secretary, uh, good to see you here today. I, I want to quote some of the things you said in your uh, comments at the very end. Together, we have the opportunity to improve countless lives, support good-paying jobs, strengthen America's manufacturers, modernize our infrastructure for decades to come, and cement America's position as the world's leading economy. All good goals. And we recognize the administration's uh, aim at reducing uh, uh, GHGs and coming down to as many renewables as possible. I'm from Texas, Gulf Coast to Texas. Um, we produce about 65% of the nation's jet fuel through my six ports that I represent, more than any other member of Congress. So energy for us is a big deal. Texas is the number one wind energy state in the country. And I think you might have even alluded to it or somebody else did. We are number two in solar panels right behind California. But we're working on that. We'll get there. We'll get there. So I appreciate you being here and bringing this all up. I want to bring a couple of projects to your attention that are called seaport oil terminals. What they do is they move product through a pipeline, <coughs> pardon me, out off the shore. It could be 20 miles, 15, 20, 30 miles. And so what happens then, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> is they move the product cleaner. <coughs> We're going to use oil and natural gas for a while, for a long while. You're seeing what's happening overseas. You gotta know the Europeans would rather buy from us than from Russia. We, and what I tell people is that uh, fossil fuels, not the enemy, greenhouse emissions are, greenhouse gases emissions are. And we're able to produce it probably cleaner than most other countries in the world. So we have a chance to move this product offshore we move it faster so it gets to the very large crude containers offshore. Right now, they, 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 the, the other countries in the world are building huge ships and they can't come up our canals, our channels into our ports. So what has to happen is they take smaller ships called lightering, you've probably heard the term, and they're having to go back and forth numbers of times while this huge container sits out there, diesel engines idling most of the time. And then you're gonna have small ships that are having to make three or four trips, the, again, diesel engines idling. So we can move it faster, less greenhouse gas emissions. We can move it safer. There's no bunch of 18-wheelers on the road. There's no 18-wheeler crashes. There's no tank cars overturning. I think you actually talked to Mr. Graves about his district with some uh, wreck in his district. And you have to know that our allies across the world would like this. It helps us with our imbalance of trade. We actually get to refine product and sell it and move it around the world. 
Um, with decades to come, you know, we're going to have a lot of natural gas, clean natural gas, and you know this, a lot of these ships are, are converting to LNG. So we want this ability. All that to say that um, a couple of these businesses have been in contact with your chief of staff, I believe it's Laura Schiller. Mm -hmm. And is she with you today? She's not here today, but she is uh, our chief of staff. She had good enough sense to stay away from this place, didn't she? <laughs> <clears throat> and then I think your general counsel, John Putnam, mm -hmm. um, is, is he with you today? Uh, not at the hearing, I don't think. Okay, well, very good. Keeping pretty busy back at headquarters. Well, all of that say, we talked about the permitting process earlier on with some of our colleagues up here, and we'd like to move that as quickly as we can uh, because time is of the essence, and we want to make sure that we can reduce that permitting process time down to the least amount. Uh, everybody wants a clean environment. You probably don't know this about the Gulf Coast of Texas, but we've got a lot of hunters and fishermen and stuff like that. We want good, clean, pristine lands to do all of those things to pass on to our kids. So what I'd like to do is to give you, this is actually a report on what we call SPOT, the Seaport Oil Terminal, a project in the national interest because we can produce it cleaner, faster, helps us with our imbalance of trade, and actually uh, does a good job for the economy while protecting the environment. And then see if I could follow back up with you in the, in the coming days to see if you can kind of get me an update on where both of these projects are. And uh, any questions for you? We got 23 seconds. I'd be happy to do that. We've got, uh, I know a lot of uh, uh, permits or, or license requests in with the Maritime Administration, and uh, I'd be happy to find out where these two uh, sit among those, and, and certainly appreciate the, uh, the complexity of the transition you're describing. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for being here, and I'll get this over to you, and I, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. I recognize Mr. Moulton for five minutes. You're recognized, Mr. Moulton. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mr. Secretary, good to see you. Thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, the IAJA appropriated more money for investing in rail than ever before in our nation's history. Now, President Biden vowed to, quote, make sure that America has the cleanest, safest, and fastest rail system in the world. Will this indeed be the administration's legacy? How will you fulfill the administration's promise, the president's promise? Well, thank you. We are enthusiastic about the opportunities here for passenger rail. As you know, uh, in any other administration, I might count myself the biggest enthusiast, uh, but I'll only ever be second place in, in this administration in terms of uh, uh, readiness and commitment to, to seeing America have the, the highest quality rail. Um, as you mentioned, we've got unprecedented resources to work with here, the most since the inception of Amtrak itself. Uh, a lot of that is candidly dealing with backlog, uh, dealing with the underinvestment that has happened in the past. Uh, but also opportunities for uh, new high-speed rail in the U.S. And we think that uh, seeing is believing. The sooner people can see successful high-speed rail deployed on American soil. Uh, I've, made this, I've made this case for a long time. I completely agree with you. In, in the May appropriations hearing uh, on the DOT budget, you said that through the IAJA, you hope to establish high-speed rail, quote, in at least two or three geographies. Have you identified those corridors yet? So I can tell you that, that FRA has been in, in dialogue with a number of project sponsors or involved in some way in uh, a number of high-speed projects. Uh, uh, certainly, of course, California, which has been discussed here, uh, the Bright Line West uh, vision, Dallas to Houston, those have all been on FRA's desk in some way or another. Uh, but of course, we're still early in the life of the uh, deployment of the federal-state partnership dollars and other resources that could make a difference here, and I don't want to prejudice any upcoming applications. Well, I understand, but we're not early in the administration's timeline here. These projects take some time, and, and I just want to emphasize that if this is going to be President Biden's legacy, if President Biden is going to be known as the father of, of developing rail in the United States, not the old-fashioned rail that we have, but high-speed rail that is truly the envy of the world and that a lot of Americans actually want to ride, then we've got to get cracking on identifying those, those quarters. Yesterday, dozens and dozens of flights were canceled on the Northeast Quarter, uh, mine among them, because uh, of a strange and unusual phenomenon called thunderstorms. The rest of the world would be able to get from Washington to Boston in three hours on a train every 20 minutes, with never a delay for weather. Not only are we not there, but we're moving in the wrong direction. In 2010, Amtrak proposed reducing travel times in the Northeast Quarter to one hour and 36 minutes from Washington to New York and one hour and 24 minutes from New York to Boston. 
Yet seven years later, in 2017, trip time goals went up from 136 to 210, and from 124 to 245, almost three hours. Just a year later, they increased again to 229 and 308. So we're not only behind China and the rest of the world, but we're going in the wrong direction. I mean, at this rate, the goals Amtrak sets 10 years from now will be worse, worse than how long it takes to travel that roller coaster ride on the Northeast Corridor today. So to meet the president's promise of the fastest trains in the world, we need a transformative investment, not just repairing an old line that is too slow by definition, by the way it was laid out in the 1830s, but actually building a new railway, the same way that we didn't just repair Route 1, we built 95. So how will, how will you make that happen with the discretionary funds in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act? So what I would say is with the dollars that we have for the Northeast Corridor, uh, first there are some needs that need to be met in terms of safety and reliability for the long run. But where you really begin to start gaining minutes comes in a couple of, a couple of ways. Uh, one is improving certain areas where there's just because of the condition of the track a need to slow down. Um, but the other, to your point, where you uh, see the most possibility for gain is actual realignment. Um, that obviously brings a lot of complexity with it, but to meet the more aggressive and ambitious goals, uh, we need to take uh, the dollars as far as they will go in that direction. And I know that's what Amtrak's working on right now. Well, let's make sure that we don't throw good money after bad. I mean, I think that's the key point here. If we're going to fulfill the president's promise of the fastest trains in the world, then they're not going to run on an old-fashioned northeast quarter. We can't just spread funds out to every state and union. We've got to pick a couple of high-speed rail projects that will succeed. And so that Americans can see the value of high-speed rail, whether you live in California or the Northeast or in Texas or in the Southeast. You know, the most popular high-speed rail corridor in the world is about the same distance as Atlanta to Chicago. Think about all the cities in between Chicago and Atlanta that you could serve with 250-mile-per-hour service. It would be transformative for this country. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Now, the gentleman's time has expired. I recognize Ms. Malatakis. You are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here today. I want to talk about um, this administration and New York City's latest scheme when it comes to the war on cars. Um, this is a pure cash grab, and it is the congestion pricing plan that was passed by the New York State Legislature um, and signed by our governor and supported by the mayor. But uh, I'm certainly opposed, and I think that this is uh, simply, you know, to, to try to impose a $35 fee, potentially, to connect, to drive within your own city, it's just completely outrageous, and it adds to why New York is such a high-tax state, uh, not only dealing with the high gas prices, the highest probably among, one of the highest in the nation, um, but high tolls, we have um, the, the skyrocketing uh, costs of, you know, used cars, everything has gone up, right, in terms of if you want to be a driver. And, you, and people need to drive to get to where they have to go, particularly in cash-starved communities. Um, in New York City, we also have speed cameras. You name it, we have it, if it's going to collect cash, unfortunately. Um, but this is what I, I seem to believe is another, um, you know, cash grab by our city and our state. It is going to be the first in the nation, Okay, and with that, uh, I understand that also the Federal Highway uh, Administration has responsibility to uh, oversee an environmental assessment uh, or an environmental impact statement. I believe being that it is going to be the first of the nation, we have a responsibility to do our due diligence and we should be conducting an environmental impact statement versus uh, a simple assessment. Can you please talk a little bit more about will you be requiring the MTA and New York City to be conducting a full and thorough uh, EIS as well as uh, it should be an economic impact study as well. Well, our responsibility is to make sure that uh, a project that comes forward with local sponsorship and interest like the congestion pricing project meets all federal legal requirements, including uh, under NEPA. Uh, I can't say here uh, whether, um, uh, based on uh, just sitting here, all of the things that go into the determination uh, of whether it's the EA uh, track or the full EIS. Uh, but what I can say is that our department will bring its best judgment to making sure that, uh, uh, that it goes through the appropriate process. Uh, and our role is to make sure that uh, all of those federal uh, hurdles are, are responsibly met. 
um, but recognizing and respecting that ultimately this is a local policy choice. Yes, but um, first of all, there is bipartisan opposition among uh, legislators and members of Congress from the New York, New Jersey area, as it will have a significant impact on our constituents who are already struggling to get by um, and make ends meet. Now, with, uh, you know, earlier this year, the MTA chief executive, uh, General Lieber, said in an interview that the FHA told her that they were going to fast track the environmental process. Can you make a commitment that you will require an environmental impact study, a full and thorough review, being that this is the first in the nation program that is, uh, I, you know, I don't want my constituents to be guinea pigs. We need to do this right. Uh, I believe that we shouldn't be doing it at all. But if you're going to do it, at least do the due diligence in making sure that we are, you know, dotting our I's, crossing our T's, and seeing what the actual impact will be on businesses on the surrounding community, on the residents that live in the central district, but also the other residents of the city from the outer boroughs that have to commute in. I, I can commit to you that the review will be proper and thorough. No unnecessary delays, but no cut corners either. Will you do an environmental impact st st study, though, a complete study, not just an assessment? That's really Again, the question. I, the legal determination about whether it falls into an EA or an EIS is not one that, that uh, I want to make sitting here. Uh, but I can tell you that the review either way will be proper and thorough on our part. Well, if it's going to be proper and thorough, then that would be the EIS. I, I, think, I think that anyone looking at this is an observer. But let's move on to the public comments. Um, how are you going to make sure that the public knows that this process is fair, that it's transparent, and it's not uh, coming at a predisposed arrival uh, at, at a determination already? Well, again, our, our role here is procedural. It has to do with making sure that the process has been met, uh, not uh, preempting a local decision about the, what, right, what the right policy is. Uh, I know there are strong views on uh, uh, all sides that cut across party lines and, uh, uh, and even across state and regional lines uh, when it comes to this project in particular. Uh, but we recognize that uh, the, the state and local role is distinct from the federal role. Uh, ours is to make sure there's transparency and thoroughness. Okay. Lastly, the, um, the, fi uh, the Federal Highway Author Authority Administration rather required MTA to answer 430 technical questions after they submitted their draft of the EA. Uh, these have not been made public or made available to Congress. Can you share those questions and answers that you received with the public? I'll look into the right uh, process for getting those out. All right, well, if we, if we believe in transparency, we want to make sure we get that information out to the public domain. So I'd appreciate your assistance with that. And my time has run out. Thank you. Thanks. The gentlewoman's time has expired. I recognize Mr. Fitzpatrick. You are recognized for <clears throat> five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Secretary Buttigieg, thanks for uh, being here. Good to see you. Uh, I want to start by... Uh, thanking you uh, for your collaboration on the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill. There's a lot of work, a lot of collaboration. You worked great with our office, and I wanted to thank you for your role. Um, I think it's going to really help America. Um, two questions. One, uh, I don't think it's a fair question because we just sent this letter last week, but I wanted to bring it to your attention. Uh, to you and FRA Administrator Bose regarding uh, the public nuisance and safety risks posed by uh, blocked railroad crossings. Certainly, I've had to deal with it in my district. I'm sure I'm not alone, for sure. Um, lasting upwards of an hour, um, these instances uh, keep communities like mine and others across the country cut off from commercial government and even more significantly emergency services, ambulances, mm -hmm. fire trucks, and whatnot. So I'm going to submit this to the record. We, we've sent it to you, but I know how agencies work. It might not have made its way to you. Um, uh, just to give a general update on the block crossing portal authorized by the IAJA section 22404. Uh, and to address mechanisms or formulas that could measure the real impact and obstructions at railroad crossings. Uh, Madam Chair, do I have permission to uh, submit this for the record? Accepted. Um, so my question, Mr. Secretary, um, I want to discuss secondary cockpit barriers. Uh, the 9-11 Commission did tremendous work many years ago uh, most, if not all, of those recommendations were adopted by Congress and implemented as part of our commitment to say never again uh, to allow terrorists to infiltrate a co cockpit and treat a commercial airliner like a guided missile. And even though this uh, was included as a requirement for new aircraft in the last FAA reauthorization nearly four years ago, 
application of this mandate has been very slow and very inconsistent. I can tell you myself and my uh, problem solver co-chair have been working very hard and we've had frustrating results across multiple administrations, to be frank, and we're hoping that we can finally fix this. Uh, since coming to Congress, we've advocated for this, both of us, and on 9-11, uh, my uh, uh, constituent, uh, Captain Victor Saracini, he was the pilot of Flight 175 that our whole world watched in horror crash into the second tower. Um, and I was just uh, wondering, Mr. Secretary, if you're, you know, how familiar you are with this, how, how much you're tracking it uh, amongst a lot of the things you're dealing with if you'd be willing to work with us as well to get this done. This is a bipartisan issue. Um, it's really incredible that you know, decades after 9-11, um, the most basic safety precaution is not being implemented. And it has, it's been blocked for all the wrong reasons by special interests that don't want it for the wrong reasons. And all of us have flown. We've watched uh, you know, the exchange uh, when the cockpit door opens for a, a pilot to go to the restroom or whatnot. And all that's placed there in our current policy is a, a food cart and an airline attendant, and 20 years after 9-11, it's really unacceptable, and it's such an easy fix. It's something that's already been approved and authorized on new aircraft. Will you be willing to work with us on getting that done and also getting retrofit for current aircraft, and do you have any other comments on the issue? Thank you, yes, well, I'm, I'm following this policy. I know there's a, a great deal of impatience, which I share about making sure that this is uh, uh, delivered, especially knowing that it's called for in, in legislation. Uh, I've met with uh, advocates as well as uh, uh, as well as experts on this, and uh, it's being taken very seriously. Um, the uh, FAA is working toward uh, getting that uh, that rulemaking advanced. Uh, certainly, welcome a chance to work with you to make sure that uh, some of the complexities are handled in the right way, and that uh, uh, that there's uh, uh, transparency around the timeline. Thank you, sir. And you know, just like all these tragic incidents, whether they be school shootings or or acts of terrorism, when we say never again, it's got to mean never again. And um, that 9-11 Commission did tremendous work, and this is one of the few, if possibly the only one, of the committee's recommendations that has not been implemented. And I fear that, um, you know, given how many years have passed since the last terror attack due to, you know, the, the, to the credit of a lot of our national security agencies have avoided that, uh, that we're still vulnerable because human instinct is to drop your guard when you've kept your guard up for so long. And I'm fearful that this is an instance uh, where we're exposed to a terror attack once again. Um, and I hope that you're willing to work with us, which you say you are, and I appreciate that. But if you could just flag this for your, for your people, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Madam Chair, you're back. Gentleman yields back. I recognize uh, Mr. Stauber for five minutes. You are recognized, Mr. Stauber. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks for coming today. Um, you are um, aware of uh, transportation issues and... Um, do you know what the most inland port in North America is or Crackson in the United States is? I'm guessing it's in Minnesota. Do you know where? The most inland measured from the coasts or uh, from the Great most Lakes? Most inland or? port is the port of Duluth Superior. Duluth, right. And I'm very proud to represent that. A lot of, um, a lot of uh, commodities uh, and uh, economic value come to and from. And I also appreciate your support for the Sulox. That money's got to continue because that helps the Midwest. So um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the chip shortage. As you know, we want to reshore it. And uh, um, I think that we, when you reshore it, you also have to reshore the minerals. Um, you're aware, uh, or maybe I'm going to make you aware, that the biggest copper nickel find in North America is in northeastern Minnesota, which we call the Iron Range. The Iron Range has mined 80% uh, the iron ore that makes 80% of this America, uh, America's steel. So if we have Buy America provisions, we have to have the Iron Range full steam ahead. Would you agree with that? Uh, I don't want to weigh in outside of my lane in terms of uh, uh, production, but I certainly agree that uh, we need to make sure we're onshoring or nearshoring raw materials that are going into the And, and we industry. have to keep our iron and, uh, industry uh, front and center. That's a strategic national security. So when you talk about um, the, the chips, you know that a F Ford F-150 gasoline has a three th or 300 chips and then the the, uh, the EV has 3,000. When you take critical minerals offline you allow foreign adversarial countries to mine that. And I'm just gonna give you an example, cobalt. Hmm. The vast majority of cobalt is mined in the Congo using child foreign slave labor. 
I think you would agree you'd rather mine those minerals in the United States under the best environmental and best labor standards. Would that be correct, Mr. Secretary? Yes, if we have a choice in where to source any of these, uh, we would certainly prefer that it be in the U.S. Yeah. Your administration just took 234,000 acres of opportunity to mine critical minerals. And let me tell you about the Duluth complex. It has 95% of our nickel reserve, 88% of our cobalt, over one-third of our copper, and other platinum group metals. And your administration won't even allow an EIS on a project-specific review. And you, you were just talking about an EIS, and you know, Mr. Secretary, the EIS is the highest uh, look from the federal government. They wouldn't even allow a project-specific review of an EIS on a mining project. So when you want to transition, and when we transition to electric vehicles, why don't we have an administration that supports mining in the United States. And by the way, there was a project labor agreement in that. All union labor from northern Minnesota. Hundreds of jobs and secondary jobs. And so I would just, uh, I would submit to you that uh, we need to mine in the United States. So we hold a destiny in the palm of our own hands. And the, the administration doesn't seem to understand that. And, and I would ask you this. Um, and I, I, think I, I think I know the answer. You do not support slave labor, is that correct? Of course. Okay. This administration doesn't understand. We, we, we can remove ourselves from child slave labor by mining in the United States and making sure our allies get these critical minerals from, from countries like the United States. Amnesty International, by a nonpartisan, has said mm. we have to stop allowing... Uh, uh, slave labor, child slave labor. And, 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 and I, would, I would submit to you, we are able, ready, and willing, Mr. Secretary, to mine these critical minerals. We have to have an administration that has the political will to do it. And it doesn't. In October of 2020, then-candidate Joe Biden said to the American people, we are going to mine these minerals domestically. That was a breath of fresh air for northern Minnesota and the Iron Range. Now, President Biden says we're going to source those minerals from foreign nations. That, Mr. Secretary, is unacceptable. That's what we talk about. We can onshore and use American labor with the best American, uh, le environmental standards and labor standards in the world. And I would ask you to go back to your administration specifically the President of the United States, and allow us to mine these minerals here in the United States, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. I recognize Mr. Van Drew. You are recognized for five minutes. Oh, your mic, sir. Thanks again for being here. Now you can hear me. See, if you didn't say anything, I, we would have cut him a break. He could have missed the whole thing. Um, in my district of South Jersey, the infrastructure law is aiding the United States Army Corps of Engineers with a major dredging project in New Jersey's intracoastal waterway. The project will clear out the clogged maritime channels of the entire Jersey shore and make my community safer and more prosperous. The law has also provided funding for airports and roads and projects across my district. South Jersey has many infrastructure needs, but I will continue to advocate this, for this infrastructure law as it is implemented over the next five years. I supported this bipartisan infrastructure law because it included conservative, conservative regulatory policies negotiated by Republicans including one federal decision. One federal decision cuts through red tape by requiring interagency cooperation, limited paperwork, and fixed permitting deadlines. This policy saves years of time and millions of dollars in the permitting of infrastructure projects. With inflation ravaging, the country is in critical situation that we need to reduce red tape so that the funding increases 
and the infrastructure law is not outpaced. That's why Republican negotiators, including these conservative regulatory policies. My concern is that this administration is far more focused on spending money than on saving money, and that irresponsible mentality could hear it, that that irresponsible mentality could hinder the implementation of the infrastructure law. One federal decision policy was put in place by President Trump in 2017 through executive order. President Biden repealed it on his very first day in office. Thanks to the infrastructure bill, one federal decision is now law and it must be implemented. So first question, Mr. Secretary, do you fully commit, fully commit, that you are proactively working to implement one federal decision in line with the letter of the law? Yes, we are. I uh, thank you, first of all, for your support for this legislation and want you to know that we take very seriously the one federal decision provisions. Uh, some of those that we've been working on this regard include establishing schedules that are consistent with the two-year average uh, for most EIS, or environmental impact statements, uh, issuing necessary authorizations, all necessary authorizations within 90 days of completing NEPA, uh, setting up a performance accountability system to track progress toward our goals, and reporting to this committee regularly on the timelines of, uh, of both the EISs and then the environmental assessments and categorical exclusions, as well as working with other agencies on how to make sure that those categorical exclusions are uh, uh, as efficiently managed as possible. So we'll continue our work on this and through the permitting dashboard, uh, aim to be as transparent as possible about uh, how we're actually tracking toward those we, goals. We, we would appreciate that and it could make a huge difference. Thank you. Second question I have, um, and Congressman Stauber touched on it a little bit, concerned about the batteries. I'm concerned about the environmental aspects of the batteries. And I'm concerned about that so much of it is controlled by China, so much is controlled in the Congo. It is virtual slave labor. We say as Americans that we are humane and we're human and we care about life, yet we buy so many products from a country that absolutely has no concern about that at all. I don't understand how we do that. I don't understand how we buy products made by the Uyghurs. I don't understand how we buy, are going to be buying products from the Congo, but the Chinese controls the Congo. And what scares me about that, Mr. Secretary, is they control too much already. They are getting stronger, and I'm sorry to say it, we are getting weaker. And you know, um, he may not have been one of your favorite presidents, but he was one of my favorite presidents, Ronald Reagan. He said, there is no country that has ever been attacked because it's too strong. We have to get stronger. We have to produce our own goods and services. We have to produce our own cobalt if we're gonna do this. We have to produce our own elements and minerals. And finally, we have to make sure if we make standards for ourselves internally that we keep those standards for everybody else. You know what's happening now, and you do know this, China is creating tons of fossil fuel. Russia is, uh, India is, other countries are. They're not following the Paris Accords in most of Europe. We're doing it and putting ourselves at a deficiency and diminishing ourselves and making ourselves weaker. That is unacceptable. That's not the America I know. It's not the America I believe in, and we have to stop it, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. That concludes our hearing. I would like to thank Secretary Buttigieg for your testimony today. Your comments have been very informative and helpful. I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time that our witnesses have our witness has provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to him in writing. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for additional comments and information submitted by members or the witness to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objections, so ordered. The committee stands adjourned.